In the battle against various illnesses that have ravaged humanity, smallpox stands above the rest. The illness was able to kill the vast swathes of the population all around the world, before being defeated in a breakthrough treatment. Through a concerted effort, the human race was able to eliminate the illness, though not before millions had perished in absolute agony. In today's video, we will cover the symptoms of smallpox, how it was able to spread, and how it was ultimately wiped from the face of the earth. Smallpox is a viral illness, usually spread through the air and close contact between two or more people. Those infected only become contagious once the first sores appear in the mouth and throat. From there, the virus spreads through coughs and sneezes. Once the virus is inhaled, the patient will experience a 12-day incubation period. During this time, they are not contagious, but the virus takes its time in making its way through the person's body. On the 13th day, a patient will begin to feel as if they have had flu, with headaches and fevers, often with some vomiting. Around the 14th day, a person will begin to notice the sores and rashes so often associated with smallpox. These sores are usually first seen in the mouth, but once these sores start breaking down, rashes start appearing all over the person's skin. It starts on the person's face before spreading to the extremities and within a day, the rash will cover the entire body. During this time is when a person will be at their most contagious. These sores will soon fill up with pus forming hard round pustules which start to scab over after a week or two. These scabs soon fall off leaving a person marked with scars and marks on their skin. And once all the scabs have fallen off, that is when a person is no longer contagious. In terms of the odds of survival from smallpox, it would first depend on which strain one had contracted. The mortality rate from variola minor is approximately 1%, while the mortality rate from variola major is approximately 30%. Very often with smallpox, complications arise in the respiratory system with conditions such as bronchitis or pneumonia. The rashes and sores can also pave the way for bacterial infections. It is common for patients to be left with pockmarks, often on the face and with damage to the eyes, resulting in blindness. And in some cases, a person can be left with encephalitis, that is, swelling in the brain. The origin of smallpox was likely from exposure to livestock. What cannot be denied is that wherever smallpox found itself, it quickly took hold over the populations. Various outbreaks through history have been attributed to smallpox, including the Plague of Athens, the Antonin Plague, and the Siege of Syracuse. Smallpox was able to spread along the various trade routes and was spread by the armies that fought during the Crusades and spread throughout the colonial settlements. Smallpox proved to be particularly devastating to the indigenous populations of the Americas. In 1520, with Herman Cortez's conquest of the Aztec Empire, smallpox found its way to the populations who had never experienced any disease like it. As a result, as many as 75 to 90% of the Aztec populations perished, making it that much easier for them to be conquered and destroyed. In North America, the Native Americans succumbed to smallpox at an alarming rate, with mortality rates as high as 90%. You may have heard stories of the European settlers purposefully handing out the smallpox infected blankets. There was only one recorded instance of this during his siege at Fort Pitt in 1763. Blankets and handkerchiefs from the fort's hospital were handed out to the native forces, with the desired effect of spreading smallpox. Whether or not this was actually needed, however, is unlikely, as by this time smallpox was already embedded in the native populations. Despite there being such a massive detriment to so many, for those who survived there was one positive. The survivors were often sought out for various professions as those who survived were immune to smallpox. These survivors would go on to work with patients suffering from smallpox, or be sought out to work with children as a way to reduce the risk of the disease spreading. Many attempts were made to deal with smallpox, with the inoculation of the uninfected in what is known as variolation. This involved dried smallpox scabs being blown into the nose of an uninfected person, or 
pus from a smallpox patient would be inserted into a person through an incision. They would then go on to contract a mild case of smallpox. After recovering from the illness, the patient was immune to the disease, however, the procedure did carry a level of risk. Around 1% of those who were inoculated in this manner would die and they would still be contagious. What's more, the variolation would require smallpox to exist. It would never be a way to completely rid the world of the disease. It was not until the 18th century that a safer and more effective method was developed to stop the spread. During the 18th century in the United Kingdom, as was the case in many parts of the world, smallpox had become as an accepted part of life. Even though the population had become somewhat resistant to the disease, it still claimed the lives of around 100 people per day. Which, if you account for population growth, would be around 600 a day with today's population. In Gloucester, where there were many dairy farms, there were farmhands and milkmaids who remained immune to smallpox. This was discovered and expanded upon by a doctor named Edward Jenner. He would struggle to inoculate those who had been exposed to a form of cowpox usually contracted through milking infected cows. Jenner then set about working out which strain of cowpox would provide immunity to smallpox. He collected pus from a milkmaid infected with cowpox and set about inoculating the son of his gardener, an eight-year-old child named James Phipps. This was done by cutting the child's arm and rubbing in the pus, resulting in James contracting a mild case of cowpox. This confirmed that cowpox could be spread from human to human, not just cow to human. Once James had recovered, Jenna exposed the child to smallpox, and as hoped, James was immune. Jenna named his method vaccination, from the Latin for the word cow, vacca, in homage to cowpox. Jenna's vaccination process was quickly dismissed by many doctors and practitioners of variolation at the time. Many thought it was repugnant that a disease originating in cows could be used to protect humans. Some early opponents even made claims that Jenna's process resulted in children making animal noises. Though this of course is likely a sign of their youth and not of any hybridization between human and cow. Others, however, did see the benefit. The likes of Elizabeth Fry, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Thomas Jefferson saw the value in Jenner's work. Jenner was adamant that his method would spell the end of the smallpox virus, making the bold claim in his 1798 papers. But in less than 200 years, Jenner's prediction would be proven correct. The vaccination of smallpox soon began around the world, starting in Europe but soon spreading to the Americas, Canada and India in the early 1800s. By the 1850s, most of the industrialized world made Jenner's treatment required by law, with imprisonment, for those who refused. By the start of the 20th century, through a combination of quarantine and vaccinations, smallpox was all but eliminated from first world countries. In 1967, the World Health Organization set the goal to completely eradicate smallpox from the entire world. At this point, the number of smallpox cases each year was thought to be around 15 million, mainly in Africa, India and South America. This was to be achieved by vaccinating every man, woman and child in the areas where smallpox was still prevalent. Teams of doctors and nurses were sent all around the world, no matter how dangerous the regions may have been. Whilst isolated outbreaks still did occur, these were largely well handled and the virus was not able to spread further. The last person to die from smallpox was a woman named Janet Parker, having become exposed to a sample at a lab in Birmingham, England. Janet died on the 11th of September 1978 following complications from pneumonia. The researcher in charge of the lab, Professor Henry Bedson, took his own life, even though to this day, it is not entirely clear how Janet was infected. By 1980, the World Health Organization officially stated that smallpox had been eradicated. One of the deadliest diseases that had long blighted the human race had been defeated, bringing true Jenner's belief that it was possible. All that remains of the smallpox virus are just two samples in two laboratories, one in Siberia and the other in Atlanta, Georgia. We very often focus on history involving individuals responsible for countless deaths on this channel. 
but for a very welcome change, we can state that Edward Jenner is the individual likely responsible for the most lives saved. Smallpox ravaged countless lives and claiming the lives of anywhere between 300 and 500 million people in the 20th century alone. In today's video, we will be covering one of the most widespread illnesses. One that currently infects 1 in 4 people, was responsible for 1 in 7 deaths in Europe and America, and in 2021 killed 1.6 million people. It is a disease associated with poverty, striking those with compromised immune systems, and associated with a telltale bloody cough. Tuberculosis, otherwise known as consumption, Thysis, or simply TB, is a disease that primarily affects a patient's lungs, though is capable of spreading to other parts of the body. In today's video, we will cover the effects of TB, its history, and how it has been combated. It is perhaps helpful to first address the shocking statistic at the beginning of the video. Whilst 1 in 4 people are infected with TB, for the vast majority, around 95%, it is handled by the immune system and will never present any symptoms. This is called latent TB infection. Thankfully, for the vast majority of people, the immune system can stop the bacteria from growing. The Mycobacterium tuberculosis responsible for the illness is airborne, and once it is inhaled and reaches the lungs, the immune system jumps to action. But the bacteria is quite a tricky organism. Once in the lungs, specialized white blood cells known as macrophages will envelop the bacteria with the goal of breaking them down. The TB bacteria is one step ahead and can avoid being dissolved. Instead, it will begin to reproduce inside the macrophage, causing an isolated, contained infection. If the bacteria is able to reproduce, it can overwhelm the macrophage, killing the cell, which will then need more and more white blood cells to deal with the growing infection. For a person with a compromised immune system, this can be a problem. The infection will take hold and a patient will begin to display symptoms. The telltale signs of infection in the lungs will include a bad cough that can last for weeks, pains in the chest and the coughing up of blood. In addition, the patient may display a loss of appetite, chills and or fever and a wasting away. Often, a person will go pale, suffering from a heavy fatigue. In around 20% of cases, the bacteria can spread from the lungs to other parts of the body, where it will do further damage. It can damage the kidneys, the bones, the lymphatic system and the central nervous system. Such cases will usually affect those with particularly compromised immune systems. As stated previously, the TB bacteria is airborne. When a person who is infected and showing symptoms coughs, speaks or even breathes, they will release the bacteria into the air. However, those with latent TB will not spread the bacteria. TB is not spread by contact such as shaking hands, nor can it be spread by touching surfaces where the infected person has been. The TB bacteria, however, is a hardy organism, capable of lasting on dry surfaces for a long time and can resist lower strength disinfectants. As for the history of the disease, there is evidence dating as far back as the Neolithic period, so that's around 5800 BCE. From examinations of an Egyptian mummy, Lady Urchiasanu revealed that she had likely succumbed to TB, with evidence of infection in her thigh bones, tissue in her lungs and gallbladder. This was only possible as much of her internal organs were not removed during the mummification process. In the Middle Ages, a disease affecting the lymph nodes known as scrofula was described as a new form of TB. The disease was known in Europe as King's Evil, as it was believed that a touch from royalty could cure the illness. Between the 1600s to the 1800s in Europe, TB was responsible for 25% of all deaths. In 1720, for the first time, English doctor Benjamin Martin postulated the cause of TB. He believed the infection was due to, quote, wonderfully minute living creatures. He therefore postulated that to avoid any infections, the uninfected should avoid spending time with the infected. But some more fantastical explanations were given, notably in New England where TB was linked to vampires. As TB would claim entire families, taking them one by one, a belief developed that those who died from TB would prey upon their still-living family members, describing the disease as a bacterium with fangs. 
In order to stop the further vampire attacks, the frightened townspeople exhumed the bodies of consumption victims and performed all manner of rituals, including burning internal organs. The case of Mercy Lena Brown, who succumbed to consumption along with her mother and sister, is one such instance. Her body and her mother and sister's bodies were exhumed, however, Mercy's body had not decomposed, unlike her relatives who were rotting away. Mercy's hair and nails appeared to have grown, and her skin and heart still contained blood, which was proof that she was a vampire. However, this can be explained by the cold weather preserving her body, yet those who gathered around ripped out Mercy's heart and burned it. They then fed the ashes to Mercy's brother, who was also suffering from TB, in a bid to cure him. From the 18th to 19th centuries, tuberculosis was epidemic in Europe and resulted in millions of deaths. As is often the case, it was the poorest in society who were most affected. Younger people were more susceptible, and so TB was dubbed the robber of youth. But it was the industrial revolution in Europe that drove up the infection rates. For the working classes toiling in the poorly ventilated factories and living in overcrowded housing, the chances of catching the disease was very high. Combined in little in the way of sanitation and being malnourished, such working class people were at risk of contracting and being killed by TB. Methods were developed to halt the spread of TB and to cure those affected. One of the most notable was developed by George Boddington, a British doctor. In 1840, he put forward his ideas in an essay on the treatment and cure of pulmonary consumption. In this, he denounced the practice of shutting patients away and believed the drugs offered at the time were ineffective. Cod liver oil, vinegar massages and inhaling hemlock were considered treatments for TB in the 19th century, but offered little in the way of any relief. Instead, Boddington suggested the use of fresh air, regular exercise, and a healthy diet in a sanatorium. At first, his ideas were ridiculed, yet he would be proven somewhat correct in his approach. German doctor Hermann Bremer established the first sanatorium Gobersdorf. After displaying a great number of successes, this became the standard treatment for TB. It was in 1882 that Robert Koch was able to identify the mycobacterium tuberculosis responsible for the disease. For those of you who watched our video on anthrax, this name may be familiar, as he played an important role in understanding how that disease was spread too. Koch would attempt to create a cure for TB with tuberculin, a sterile liquid derived from the cultures of the bacteria. Unfortunately, tuberculin failed as a cure, but would prove effective as a diagnostic test for the disease, as when injected into an infected patient, the injection site will become raised and swollen. This breakthrough was vital as a means to identify TB and to ensure the patient is not suffering from another condition. Koch would be awarded a Nobel Prize in 1905 for his work on tuberculosis. In 1921, Albert Calmet and Jean-Marie Camille Guerin developed the BCG vaccine whilst working at the Pasteur Institute. It, however, was not without controversy or without scepticism. This was only heightened following the Lübeck disaster. Between 1929 and 1933, 251 children were inoculated with contaminated doses of the BCG vaccine. As the goal was to give the vaccines to children at an early age to avoid the deaths of young people, the children affected were very young infants. 72 of those given the contaminated vaccine would die as a result. The cases were investigated, and those responsible for the contamination were sentenced for negligent homicide. It took time for the vaccine to be accepted, but has proven to be effective. For the last 80 years, it is still the most widely used vaccine and has a documented protective effect against both meningitis and TB in children. The breakthrough for treatment of TB came in 1943 and the development of effective antibiotics. A team of scientists by the name of Selman Waxman, Elizabeth Budgie and Albert Schatz discovered streptomycin, a drug capable of dealing with tuberculosis as well as rat bite fever and endocarditis. Waxman would claim near full credit for the discovery, with Elizabeth Budgie being told that it was not important for her name to be put on the patent, as she would one day get married and have a family. Waxman alone would receive the 1952 Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for this discovery. Schatz would go on to sue Waxman, where he would be able to obtain a cash settlement and 3% of royalties. 
Elizabeth Budgie would only receive 0.2% of the royalties, along with a number of others whose work contributed to the discovery. Whilst a rather messy affair, this did help to reshape just how credit is properly apportioned for scientific discoveries. Since then, a number of drugs have been developed to treat tuberculosis. Isoniazid, pyrazinamide, ethimbutol, and rifenpin serve as a four-drug cocktail in the treatment for a drug-susceptible TB. Whilst TB does exist in every country, it is not endemic in all countries. Today, it is the developing world where TB is the biggest threat. Most of the deaths and infections occur in children. The combination of overcrowding and malnutrition continue to be some of the key factors in the spread of TB. But those with compromised immune systems, such as those affected with HIV AIDS, are more likely to become sick with TB, and is one of the leading causes of death amongst people living with HIV. In 2018, the United Nations and the World Health Organization was able to unify the UN member states to confirm their commitment to dealing with TB epidemics. This is to be achieved through administering preventative treatments to some 30 million people and to increase funding into the research of the disease. Whilst rates for TB are falling, the fight against TB is far from over. Tuberculosis for now remains one of the deadliest threats to many in the developing world. It has proven a disease capable of claiming millions of lives throughout its history, but in much of the developed world it is largely a thing of the past. As is often the case in these videos, much more is still needed to be done to beat the disease and rob it of its epidemic status. And again, it is a case of disparity and inequality that drives infections. I would invite you all to look further into what is being done to combat TB. And never forget that whilst it may seem a disease of the past to some, it is still very much a real and present threat to many. I shall leave you with a terrifying statistic. On average, every day, over 4,000 people will pass away from tuberculosis. For a new series on this channel, we will be looking at some of the most disturbing illnesses that have ravaged the human race throughout its history. We will be starting with syphilis, a disease that became associated with the unclean, the deviant and the morally bankrupt. Syphilis causes sores, rashes and fevers in the early stages, but by the final stage, it can result in tumour-like growths, damage to the nervous system and even death. In today's video, we will explore the history of syphilis, its impact, and some of the disturbing experiments involving syphilis. Syphilis is a bacterial disease caused by the Treponema pallidum organism. It is largely contracted through unprotected intercourse, though it can be passed from mother to child in the utero, resulting in the child being born with congenital syphilis. It is often called the Great Imitator, as many of the symptoms can be dismissed as other illnesses. These include fever, rashes, or swollen glands. At first, the disease will present itself with lesions on a person's genitals. This may be all the person experiences. However, without treatment, the disease may progress with skin growths akin to venereal warts and flu-like symptoms. Whilst these symptoms may pass within a few weeks, they may come and go over months before they fade. Even if the symptoms fade, the person will still be infected. This is known as latent syphilis and it can persist for decades and lead to serious problems if not treated and is potentially life-threatening. People with this final stage of syphilis may experience meningitis, strokes and even dementia-like symptoms. There are two main schools of thought as to where syphilis originated, Columbian and pre-Columbian hypotheses. The Columbian hypothesis states that in addition to bringing back the wealth of the Americas, Columbus and his voyagers brought back with them syphilis. It was only three years after Columbus's first voyage that a major outbreak of syphilis struck soldiers during the Italian War of 1494. The French army and its Spanish mercenary auxiliaries captured the city of Naples and soon found themselves afflicted. 
As the soldiers returned home, they brought with them and spread the disease all over Europe. The pre-Columbian hypothesis states that syphilis was already in Europe and indeed the rest of the world, and that syphilis may have just been misdiagnosed as leprosy. The mutation of syphilis could have been possible due to the increase in large towns, populations and low levels of sanitation. For both of these theories, there is evidence in the form of skeletons bearing evidence of syphilis in both the Dominican Republic and in Austria, dated well before the voyages of Columbus. Wherever the disease may have come from, what cannot be denied is how fast it was able to spread using the many trade routes that exploded into being. Sailors would carry the disease around the world, passing the disease to whomever they would have had unprotected intercourse with. Often, this would be women who worked in brothels. Early reports of the disease described those who were affected dying within months, perhaps indicating a much more lethal strain that exists today. Early attempts to treat the disease included mercury, either by ingestion, as a rub on the skin, or as a vapour. It soon became standard naming practice that a nation would call syphilis after their long-time rival or enemy. For example, the English called it the French disease, the Turks called it the Christian disease, and the Russians called it the Polish disease. Due to the way it spread, syphilis was soon linked with poor morals and seen as a divine punishment. Those who were infected were shunned. Whilst the disease would affect people from every social class and social standing, it particularly affected the poor. Women who worked as prostitutes or in the domestic services were often at high risk of being infected. Its link to promiscuity and prostitution made syphilis not only something to fear as a potential consequence, but also developed into a taboo against sex itself. It's important to note that every class was affected by syphilis, despite the push to label this a disease of the poor. Some of history's most famous individuals are believed to or actually had contracted syphilis, notably Al Capone, Leo Tolstoy and Archduke Otto of Austria, brother to Franz Ferdinand whose death sparked World War I. Much work was also done in repairing the damage done to a person afflicted by syphilis. It was common that the afflicted nose would fall off and so a market for artificial noses emerged. So too did attempts to surgically reconstruct nose defects, with doctors such as Gasparo Tagliacozzi establishing the fundamentals of reconstructive surgery. The first breakthrough cure for syphilis was discovered by Sachiro Hatta in 1909. By 1943 and the discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming meant the world had access to a reliable cure. Nevertheless, there have been throughout human history instances of unscrupulous doctors and governments using unwilling patients to develop a better understanding of the disease. During Imperial Japan's occupation of mainland China, an infamous biological weapons testing group was established, known as Unit 731. In one of their experiments, prisoners were forced to infect one another with syphilis, with women forcibly impregnated. The studies involved observations as to how the disease developed and how it affected an unborn fetus. We do have a video on Unit 731 for those who wish to learn more about it, as this single experiment is but scratching the surface. Another horrendous experiment is the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. The study began in 1932 and ran until 1972, only stopping when the story broke in the media. The study involved hundreds of black men with syphilis who were mainly poor and came from farming backgrounds. They were promised medical treatment as well as to look into the vague illness, bad blood. The goal of the experiment was to understand the effects of syphilis if left untreated, particularly on African American men as the illness was thought to devastate their respiratory system. The men in the study were never at any point told of their syphilis diagnosis and were blind to the true nature of the experiment. As stated previously, penicillin was discovered in 1943 and by late 1940s it had become standard treatment. The men were never given any meaningful treatment and instead were given placebos and were told they were suffering from another illness. 
As a result, many of the men went on to infect their partners, with 19 children also being born with congenital syphilis. Despite the cure being openly available, no such treatment was given and 100 of the men died from a very preventable illness. Anti-poor and racist beliefs pushed the notion that these groups of people were susceptible to syphilis were the key drivers in its spread and that they simply did not care enough about the illness to seek treatment. What's more, following the Second World War, the United States was instrumental in forming the Nuremberg Code. This code was supposed to provide protection for research subjects, yet the experiment was able to continue for just under three decades, in a very clear breach of this code. As a result of this experiment, many people, in particular the African American community to this day, do not trust the government in respect of public health. While syphilis has been brought under a level of control, it is the disease that still claims the lives of around 100,000 people each year. Syphilis retains its stigma as one of the nastiest venereal diseases. Whilst its potency is not what it once was, it is a disease that cannot be ignored. Syphilis is a story of stigmatization where it would be given the name of the nation's most hated enemy and then blamed on the poor and other marginalized groups. However, it is not through such acts that diseases can be beaten and controlled, but through understanding and eliminating factors that allow it to spread. I had a little bird. Its name was Enza. I opened the window and influenza. Following the devastation of the First World War, yet another catastrophic loss of life would follow. A deadly and virulent influenza, dubbed the Spanish Flu, tore through much of the world, ravaging a still-recovering population. It is thought that anywhere from 50 million to 100 million people died from the outbreak, mainly affecting the otherwise healthy and young. In a few short, deadly months, the Spanish flu would kill far more people than were killed in the entire First World War. In today's video, we will cover just what the Spanish flu was, how it spread, and its impact on the world. Generally speaking, influenza or flus are relatively common, usually seasonal viruses that affect millions each year. Symptoms include fever, chills, coughing, headaches, and runny noses though many of you watching will know all too well. Today, the flu will claim the lives of hundreds of thousands of people each year, usually in the winter. Typically, those who die from the flu will be the elderly or those with underlying health conditions, such as asthma or heart problems. Today, such at-risk people are offered vaccines to help increase their immune response and increase survival rates. The flu is spread mainly by drops of saliva made when people with the flu cough, sneeze, or talk, which if ingested or enters the nose of another person means they too could contract the disease. As well as affecting humans, influenza viruses affect all manner of animals, notably birds and pigs. The influenza virus is highly mutable, meaning it can change how it affects its host and avoid immune responses. However, the changes are slight meaning a person's immune system can deal with the infection in some way. Nevertheless, the change can sometimes be of such a magnitude that the virus is capable of crossing over from animals to infecting humans. This is known as an antigenic shift, and it is thought that this is what made the Spanish flu so deadly. One theory for the origin of Spanish flu was originally found in a form of avian flu that mutated to be capable of infecting humans. This meant people's immune systems were ill-equipped to deal with a type of virus they had never encountered. Once infected with the Spanish flu, people would exhibit symptoms similar to that of regular influenza, fever, chills, etc. But, their severity would depend on which wave one was infected with. The first wave is understood to have struck in the spring of 1918. The first reported outbreak can be traced to the military base Camp Funston in Kansas. Camp Funston was one of the many camps that trained American soldiers who would be sent to Europe to fight in the First World War. Well over 1,000 soldiers were hospitalized by an outbreak of influenza, with 38 dying by March of 1918. 
From these camps, the disease was able to spread amongst not only the nearby civilian populations, but also to a number of military camps. And when these soldiers were sent to the European theatres of the First World War, they brought with them their deadly virus. Due to much in the way of censorship during the war, the cases appearing in France, Britain and Germany were not reported on, as to not dampen the morale. Instead, the Spanish media broke stories of deadly flu in neutral Spain, hence the name given to the pandemic. In May of 1918, some 90,000 cases were reported in Spain. All the while, the virus spread through much of the world, carried largely with the mobilization of soldiers. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers felt ill, with a noticeable impact on the war effort. Some sought to attribute the illness to the conditions of trench warfare, rather than it being an illness. The first wave was relatively mild, with not too many more dying than what would be expected in a regular flu. This led many to believe that it was just the regular flu outbreak. However, the second wave would be where the real danger would present. The second wave is thought to have started in August of 1918. It is likely thought to have spread from three key large port cities, Freetown, Brest and Boston. These key ports were vital for troop movements and became the centre of the Spanish flu's transmission of the deadliest second wave, with staggering death rates. In October of 2018, some 195,000 people died in the United States alone. Symptoms during the second wave were notably different than typical influenza, meaning cases were often misdiagnosed as cholera or typhoid. Hemorrhaging from mucous membranes in the nose, stomach and intestine were commonplace, something not usually seen in the seasonal flu. Bleeding from the ears and nose were a striking symptom of those affected. Perhaps even stranger was that these severe cases were seen only in the young, aged between 20 and 40 with pregnant women being the most at-risk group, with mortality rates as high as 71%. Around 85% of the deaths were caused by the viral infection, and the damage it caused to the lungs, resulting in respiratory failure. But when doctors examined the bodies of those who died, the autopsies revealed lungs filled with fluid. The alveoli, microscopic air sacs in the lungs, were filled with fluid. As their lungs slowly filled, the patient's skin would turn a grim, bluey-black colour. It became such an omen of death that those who arrived at the hospital with blackened feet were deemed beyond help. The intense autoimmune response of the otherwise fit and healthy could result in the body being overwhelmed. As the white blood cells and fluid produced attempted to deal with the virus in the lung, the patient would succumb before the virus could even be dealt with. It got to the point where people would die in the streets, or simply just pass away at home. Sometimes, an entire family claimed. In one striking example, one nurse found a husband dead in the same room where his wife lay with newly born twins. It had been 24 hours since the death and the births. As the war reached its end and demobilized troops returned home, many brought with them the Spanish flu. The deadly flu made its way all around the world, with some of the worst effects seen in India. Bombay was the first city to fall to the disease in June of 1918. It is again thought that troop movements were a key vector of transmission for the disease. It is estimated that as many as 12 million people died of the Spanish flu in India alone, representing around 5% of the population at the time. Although, some estimates do go even higher, to 18 million. A lackluster monsoon season and the requisition for food for the war effort meant that many in India were going hungry. This only weakened them further. India too suffered a first wave that was relatively mild, followed by the deadly second wave. Again, the age group of 20 to 40 were hit the worst. As millions died, government sought to mitigate the risk of infection. Mask wearing became mandatory in a number of cities, with many initiatives to encourage the making and wearing of masks set up. The spread of the disease was treated with the utmost seriousness, with police in Chicago instructed to arrest anyone sneezing or coughing in public. Schools were closed, and public events such as dances were prohibited. The quarantining of those even potentially affected became part of everyday life, 
Such measures were often framed in the way of protecting the troops and working towards the war effort, with those who refused being labelled as a wartime slacker. But not everyone followed these new rules, some seeing such mandates as an infringement on civil liberties. Many objected to the notion of fines or jail time for refusing to wear masks, especially when public officials were caught without masks in public spaces. By the early months of 2019, however, the third wave struck. Whilst less deadly than the second wave, hundreds of thousands were still killed. Great Britain, Spain, Mexico, and the northern European countries were the most affected. Whilst the fourth wave would be milder still, the damage of the Spanish flu was catastrophic. The speed in which most of the deaths occurred, thanks to the second wave, had a huge impact on societies that were already war-weary. As the flu tended to target those of working age, the effect on the economy and productivity of many countries only added to the post-war wars. Birth rates are thought to have plummeted due to the higher rates of miscarriages caused by the virus. It is thought that from a worldwide population of 1.8 billion, that anywhere from 500 million to 1 billion people were affected, with estimates as high as 100 million dead. To put this into context of the four-year-long First World War, it is thought that some 15 to 22 million people were killed. In less than one year, the Spanish flu claimed as many, if not far more. Normally, the flu will boast a mortality rate of less than 0.1%. The Spanish flu had an average worldwide mortality rate of 2.5%. Today, the seasonal flu is just part of the winter seasons, and most of us will never be badly affected. Flu is seen as something that can be lived with, just part of life. After all, we have vaccines, access to antibiotics, and even better sanitation, all to help deal with such seasonal flus. But the Spanish flu pandemic shows us just how deadly a novel virus can be, even one as commonplace as the flu. Many of you will no doubt recall fears of avian or swine flu outbreaks that permeated the media. The signs of a potential antigenic shift are met with fear of a repeat of the 1918 pandemic, and a more recent example has likely already come to mind. And whilst we live in a world with better access to medication and sanitation, these are not things that are available to all. We live in a far more connected world, meaning transition of such illnesses could be all the easier. In human history, only one disease has been completely eradicated, that being smallpox. Well, apart from two samples that still exist in two laboratories in the US and Russia. We are, however, incredibly close to eradicating a second, polio. Polio is a disease that will tend to affect children under 5 years old, and is capable of resulting in a patient being paralysed for life. To date, there is no cure for polio. It can only be prevented through vaccinations. The vaccinations have been able to reduce cases to just 6 in 2021. In today's video, we will cover just what polio is, the history of trying to understand it, and just how it will soon be made a disease of the past. Polio is caused by the aptly named polio virus, of which there are three distinct types. Though all three types produce the same effect. Polio favours transmission in unsanitary conditions, often transmitting through infected fecal particles. Though usually, polio spreads through consumption of infected water or food. In some instances, infected saliva entering a person's mouth can also cause infection, though this is less common. Those most at risk of infection, as well as those who are more prone to a serious case, are those who are malnourished, have an immune deficiency, or women who are pregnant. It is important to note that polio is capable of crossing the maternal-fetal barrier during pregnancy, though the fetus is not affected by either maternal infection. In fact, it would appear that the maternal antibodies can be passed through the placenta, providing a level of immunity for the child's first few months. 
Once a person is infected, the incubation period will usually be between 6 and 20 days. In just under 3 quarters of cases, a patient will present no symptoms, whilst just under a quarter of cases will display only mild symptoms. For the mild cases, a person will present symptoms such as high temperature, fatigue and muscle pains. Most people will recover and movement will slowly come back over the next few weeks. It is in the last 1% of cases where the real danger lies. The polio virus is more than capable of affecting the spinal cord, leading to many of the symptoms associated with the disease. Muscles will weaken, becoming floppy and uncontrollable, with a person often experiencing a pins and needles like sensation in their legs. In some instances, polio will cause meningitis, where the membrane around the brain and spinal cord become inflamed. In the most severe of cases, a person will become paralysed in what is known as acute flaccid paralysis. The parts of the body most affected are the legs, but in some instances will involve the muscles of the head, neck and diaphragm. For those who develop paralysis, anywhere up to 10% will die when the paralysis affects the muscles required for breathing. Other symptoms can include encephalitis, that is an infection and inflammation of the brain tissue. This in turn can lead to confusion, fever and even seizures. The virus targets the receptors found on the patient's neurons. It is through this process that a person will start to lose control and function of their muscles, ultimately resulting in paralysis. This however may not be the end of the matter. Some people will develop post-polio syndrome, which can affect people some 15 to 40 years after contracting the illness. Post-polio syndrome is where some of the symptoms reoccur or may even get worse. The symptoms include constant fatigue, muscle weakness and muscle and joint pain. Post-polio syndrome is not too well understood. It is not known just how many are affected, nor is it clear what causes the condition. One leading theory is that the syndrome comes about from neurons previously damaged by the polio vaccines further deteriorating which would explain how it can take years of their use to become damaged to the point of post-polio syndrome taking hold. It is believed that polio has affected humanity for thousands of years. The earliest depiction of polio was found on an ancient Egyptian stone slab. The priest is shown to have a withered leg and is using a walking stick, understood to be the result of polio. Ancient Egyptian art tended to show little variation in how it depicted people, with very little in the way of individuality, highlighting the likelihood that this was not an artistic choice, and was rather an accurate representation of the priest. However, there are only sporadic occurrences of the disease until the last 300 years or so. The doctor first known to have identified the disease was Michael Underwood, an early proponent of paediatrics as its own distinct branch of medicine. In 1789, Underwood published the first clear description of polio in infants in his medical textbook. During the early 1800s, isolated epidemics began to be reported in medical texts, with a steady increase in the number of children becoming paralysed by the disease. But in an odd set of circumstances, improvements in hygiene in the industrialised cities played a role in polio cases becoming more severe. It has been postulated that very young children were often exposed to polio and contracted only mild symptoms, all the while developing an immunity to the disease. During times where there was little in the way of proper sewers or hygiene practices, such infections of the very young were commonplace. But as hygiene improved, the incredibly high instances of the very young being exposed to polio was reduced. Before long, fewer and fewer people developed an immunity to polio, resulting in a delayed exposure to the disease until later on in childhood or even in adult life, when the disease is more likely to take the paralytic form. It was in 1905 that Swedish physician Ivar Wickman built upon our understanding of polio. He studied the epidemic that affected Sweden in 1905, making some key observations. 
He observed that polio seemed to spread through physical contact, that it spread along streets and railway lines, and postulated that many of the infections took place in schools. Wickman asserted that polio was a very contagious disease, and that the severity of the symptoms vary from person to person. Crucially, he suggested that both the severe and less severe cases ought to be regarded as equal, as he correctly believed that those with the mild symptoms could spread the disease to the healthy, who in turn may contract paralytic symptoms. By the turn of the 1900s, numerous attempts had been made to discover a cure for polio. Some of the treatments suggested during the 1916 epidemic in New York that claimed over 2,000 lives included giving children radium water, bathing them in almond meal, and to give oxygen through lower extremities by positive electricity. But perhaps the most infamous of the polio treatments was the iron lung. The iron lung was invented by Philip Drinker, Lewis Shaw, and James Wilson. The patient is encased within the iron lung, and the machine works by changing the pressure inside. When the pressure is lowered, the chest cavity expands. And when the pressure is raised, the chest cavity contracts. This process, in essence, does the breathing of the paralytic patient who would be otherwise incapable of breathing by themselves. Though inefficient, the iron lung was able to save many. It was a large piece of machinery with an even larger price tag. What's more, patients would need to be encased within the iron lung often for months or years at a time. In some instances, patients would have to remain within the iron lung for life. It was in the 1930s that the first viable polio vaccine was developed. Maurice Brody developed an inactivated vaccine where the spinal cords of infected monkeys were ground up and treated with formaldehyde, killing the virus. Early testing of the vaccine seemed promising, but when three children developed paralytic polio following receiving the vaccine, Brody's vaccine was withdrawn. It would be a further 20 years for any further breakthrough in a vaccine. In 1952, Jonas Salk and his team at the Pittsburgh University developed their polio vaccine. The Salk vaccine was tested and shown to be effective against all three types of the virus. Whilst it was around 70% effective against polio virus type 1, also known as PV1, it was well over 90% effective against PV2 and PV3. This vaccine built upon Brody's work using an inactive virus that had been treated with formaldehyde before being injected. This would not be the only effective polio vaccine developed around this time. Albert Sabin believed a live virus vaccine would be more effective. Sabin had previously developed vaccines for sleeping sickness, sandfly fever, and dengue fever. Sabin's research on the polio virus showed that the virus was capable of reproducing in the intestines before it attacked the nervous system. This suggested that the virus could be cultivated in tissues other than brain tissue, allowing for simpler and cheaper methods of vaccine development. Sabin would go on to develop an oral vaccine. This version would use a strain of polio virus that caused an autoimmune response, but did not seem to cause paralysis. He would first test the vaccine on himself, his family and colleagues, and it would go on to be successful in clinical trials. The vaccine was rolled out in the Soviet Union and then to the wider world. Salk's vaccine, however, did fall out of favour due to what is known as the Kutter incident. In April of 1955, the Kutter laboratory produced some 120,000 doses of the Salk vaccine under licence. But the vaccine contained live polio virus which had not been correctly inactivated. The batch of Kutter vaccines was quickly withdrawn after cases of polio were reported. Some 40,000 mild cases were reported whilst 56 cases were seen of paralytic polio. Five children would tragically die as a result of the error, with lawsuits and investigations being lodged into what went wrong. Due to the risks, Sabin's vaccine became the favoured vaccine for much of the world. In recent years, however, advances in the production of the vaccine has resulted in a much safer inactivated polio vaccine. 
It is important to note that the inactivated vaccine offers better protection against paralytic polio. Whilst the live vaccine is more effective when used where polio is not yet eradicated, as it is better at controlling the spread of polio and stopping outbreaks. Even to this day, some countries require a polio vaccine before travel, and many countries include the polio vaccine in the shots that children receive. It is also important to note that immunity against one of the three strains of the polio virus does not confer immunity to the other two. Therefore, vaccines were produced to combat each of the strains. By 1999, the second variant of the polio virus was eradicated, with the third variant following suit in 2012. Today, there are only two countries where polio is endemic, Afghanistan and Pakistan. This is in part due to a belief that the polio vaccine is a ploy to sterilize Muslims. One point of contention was for the hunt for Osama bin Laden. A polio vaccine rollout was used as a cover for the operation. Despite many of the Muslim leaders in these regions promoting the safety of the vaccine, there are still some who are skeptical, meaning the virus will remain endemic. A number of people throughout history have also been affected by polio. Notably filmmaker Francis Ford Coppola, musician Neil Young, and United States President Franklin D. Roosevelt, though the latter is disputed. Roosevelt was diagnosed with polio in 1921, and it is understood that his drive to find treatments, cures, and a vaccine played a key role in the development of the vaccines. However, retrospective analysis of his symptoms point to Guillain-Barre syndrome. Regardless, Roosevelt did found the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which was largely responsible for the development of the vaccines. Whilst polio is soon to be a thing of the past, it has left its mark on many. The lifelong damage it can cause, particularly affecting children, is truly disturbing. The defeat of the polio virus is another testament to the success of the vaccine programs that have saved many. Although it is important to remember that the virus can still be detected in countries where it has long since been eliminated. In June of 2022, the polio virus was detected in the sewage network of North and East London. The United Kingdom is considered by the World Health Organization to be polio free with low risk for polio transmission due to the high level of vaccination across the population. And thankfully, this is the case for much of the world. And no doubt polio will be the second disease to be eliminated from the world, hopefully in our lifetimes. The subject of today's video is a disease, a disease that even to this day is not properly understood. It is a disease that robs a patient of movement, of control of their own body, and can leave them in a catatonic state for decades, all whilst fully aware of the long passage of time. It is thought that some 500,000 people were affected during the pandemic, killing around a third and leaving the rest permanently changed. Sleeping sickness struck during the early 20th century before seemingly disappearing. In today's video, we will cover the symptoms of sleeping sickness, what is understood about the disease, and its potential impact on world history. Sleeping sickness, or encephalitis lethargica, or EL for short, is a rare form of encephalitis, or swelling of the brain. The disease affects the part of the brain responsible for the production of dopamine and therefore vital for the control part of the nervous system. EL was first identified by Konstantin Alexander von Economo, an Austrian physicist and neurologist. He identified a novel disease amongst patients initially thought to be suffering with meningitis or delirium. The symptoms are wide-reaching and dependent on the type one is infected with. The most common symptoms are sleep disorders and Parkinism with involuntary movements that come with such a condition. The symptoms of EL made diagnosis difficult, with common ailments such as headaches, lethargy, and fever present in the early stages of the disease. 
This widespread and varied number of symptoms in a wide degree of severity proved difficult to comprehend the disease. Von Economo described three clinical forms of encephalitis lethargica, with particular symptoms. For example, the hyperkinetic form will present symptoms such as visual hallucination, mania, and muscle jerks. This new disease was first noticed in 1916 in Vienna, but examples in France, the United Kingdom, and the United States soon followed. This disease tended to have three stages, the first being sleep disorders, and the second being uncontrollable eye movements. This was then followed by a period of recovery, where all seemed well. What would then strike some years later would be the third stage, the patient suffering a Parkinson's-like deterioration. Death would usually come from falling into a coma, respiratory failure, or damage to the brain caused by the inflammation. The patient's extremities would become incredibly weak or rigid, requiring another person to assist with movement. Another notable symptom was that the patient was left with an expressionless, mask-like face, unable to control their facial muscles. Some patients would experience an oculogenic crisis, that being when their eyes uncontrollably roll to the back of the head, and this could last hours at a time. Some patients experienced drastic changes in their mood or persona, altered by the damage caused by the inflammation of the brain. Patients would be quick to anger, often losing part of who they were prior. The sleeping disorders would leave the patient asleep for weeks at a time. Whilst they could be easily awoken, they would fall straight back asleep. Some would have an inversion to the day-night cycle, whilst some would experience severe insomnia. In some cases, the sleep would become a coma, one many would never awaken from. Many were left in sleep-like states for decades, with no cure or treatment available. Many were left to the care of specialized hospitals, rows of beds of the sleeping unable to be awakened. What is unbelievably terrifying is that some of those in such care hospitals were in fact conscious and aware of the passage of time, but trapped inside their unresponsive bodies. By the 1920s, these delayed cases of Parkinism began to become more apparent. Unlike other Parkinism conditions, it appeared to affect younger people more than older, usually people aged between 10 and 45. As quickly as the disease appeared, so too did it disappear. All the while, the Spanish flu raged, claiming millions of lives. Whilst some theories sought to link EL with the Spanish flu, there was no definitive answer as to its cause. Even to this day, any link between the Spanish flu and EL have not been confirmed, merely that the two diseases ran rampant at the same time. It was not until 1969 that there was any hope in treating those left in the sleeping states caused by EL. Levodopa was hailed as a miracle drug, capable of curing Parkinism. The medicine was designed to treat the motor conditions of Parkinism with the use of dopamine. This work was pioneered by Oliver Sacks, who documented his experiences in his book, Awakenings. The medicine was administered to EL patients, including to one by the name of Rose R. Rose had been affected by EL in the 1920s, falling into a catatonic sleep. When she was given the drug, she awoke, having missed the last 40 years. She was unable to comprehend the new world, still feeling connected to the 1920s. Eventually, she was no longer responsive to Levodopa, and she fell back into a coma. For others, any initial success was followed by manic responses and uncontrollable movements. After decades of deterioration, many of those long suffering with the effects of EL were not treatable. The damage to the brain meant long-term recovery was not possible for many of the patients. Whilst there was no other pandemic or outbreak of EL, there have been sporadic cases from time to time. One example is that of 23-year-old Becky Howells who, in 1933, was struck by EL. Attempts were made to investigate whether or not there was a link between Spanish flu and EL. With brain tissues from the 1920s examined, 
No evidence of a link was found, and whilst Howells did survive, it took years for her to recover. Around the same time, Dr. Russell Dale of the Great Ormond Street Hospital sought to gather as many patients as possible suffering with EL. He managed to build up a caseload of 20 patients, and set about trying to find something to link all the patients as to a potential cause. One common complaint all made was that before suffering from EL, they had experienced a sore throat. Tests revealed that all patients had been infected with a rare strain of Streptococcus bacteria, the bacteria responsible for such a common affliction. It is thought that in some people, the body's autoimmune response overreacts to the infection, attacking the brain instead and causing Parkinism. When original records of the 1920s were examined, it was revealed that many of the EL patients too were infected with Diplococcus, a strain of Streptococcus. This remains one of the more plausible theories as to the cause of EL, yet is no way definitive. As for cures, there is currently none known. Whilst there are treatments to help manage the symptoms, EL remains one of the less well understood diseases. It is thankfully very rare, with only a few dozen examples since the pandemic of the early 19th century. What is interesting, however, is the potential role that the disease had on world history. United States President Woodrow Wilson was to play a major role in the World War I peace talks of Versailles. He was noted for his position that Germany should not be excessively punished. This was at odds with the war-torn French delegation. Wilson was famously taken ill during the Versailles talks, with what was thought to have been a stroke, and following this, he reversed his position on the harsh treatment of Germany. However, EL as a possible cause for his change ought to be considered, as Wilson became bedridden and was prone to bouts of euphoric or manic episodes, and was paranoid about protecting his papers from everyone. The consequences of the Treaty of Versailles are understood to have contributed to the rise of Nazism, and therefore, the Second World War, perhaps in part caused by Wilson's possible EL infection. There are also questions as to whether Adolf Hitler's Parkinism, perhaps best seen in his uncontrollable jerk of his left arm, could have been caused by EL. Hitler's first signs of Parkinism were in 1923, when he was only 34. This would fit the timeline for the EL pandemic. He was noted by some to experience the telltale signs of the eyes rolling to the back of the head, something seen with a Parkinism post-EL. It should be noted that many of Hitler's beliefs were already cemented before the First World War, yet the condition may in part explain some of his more manic or compulsive behaviours. There is no doubt that Encephalitis lethargica is one of the more disturbing and interesting diseases of the 20th century, overshadowed by the millions dead at the hands of the Spanish flu. An enigma to this day, thankfully rare but nevertheless a nightmare. To be trapped inside one's own body, to lose control of bodily functions is a horror that one cannot comprehend. One extra thing to mention is that whilst editing this video, we found images and a report of someone who suffered with EL. This patient pulled out their own eyeballs. There are images of a doctor holding her head still, whilst the camera shows the empty sockets. And in the next shot, two eyes with optic nerves still attached. This led me to come to the opinion that EL is the most terrifying disease in history. We can only hope that such a terrifying disease doesn't return anytime soon. Few diseases can strike fear into new parents as much as meningitis. Whilst it is a disease that primarily affects infants, it can still impact teenagers and adults, especially those who are immunocompromised. Meningitis is a disease brought on by a viral, bacterial or even fungal infection, meaning it can be brought on by all manner of pathogens and other diseases. In today's video, we will explain what meningitis is, its history and what can be done to reduce its impact. It is perhaps helpful to first explain what is meant by meningitis. 
It is the name given to the inflammation of the membranes that protect the brain and spine. Whilst there can be swelling of the brain, meningitis is described as the swelling of these membranes, or meninges. Primarily, it is the inner layers, called the arachnoid and the pia layers that are affected. Between these two layers is the subarachnoid space, which contains the cerebrospinal fluid. This fluid acts as a cushion for the brain and spine, whilst also providing nutrients. The fluid contains glucose, proteins, and a small number of white blood cells, normally 5 per cubic microliter. Meningitis will be caused when the pathogen reaches the inner meninges. This can be done by consuming infected mucus, sinus infections, or even sharing an infected person's utensils. Bacterial or viral meningitis will usually occur when the pathogen passes through the blood-brain barrier from the bloodstream. Once through the blood barrier, the pathogen will reproduce within the cerebrospinal fluid. The inflammation of the meninges will happen not as a result of the bacteria, but rather caused by the response of the immune system. Once the bacteria are identified, the body will produce a large amount of white blood cells to combat the bacteria. As a result of the influx of white blood cells into the cerebrospinal fluid, the meninges will become inflamed. As more white blood cells flood into the fluid, the levels of glucose will plummet. Levels can increase as much as 20 or 30 times higher than the normal white blood cell count. Meningitis is therefore best simplified by the higher than normal presence of white blood cells in the cerebrospinal fluid and the dangerous consequences of the immune response. A person will first begin to experience headaches and fevers. As pressure from the inflammation affects the brain, the person's neck will begin to stiffen. They will experience hearing loss and an aversion to light. Ultimately, a person will become incredibly confused, a telltale symptom of meningitis. As the body continues to fight the infection, sepsis can be triggered resulting in the infamous rash. Oxygen rates in the blood will drop, meaning it can lead to organ failure and death. Death can follow strikingly quick, sometimes within 24 hours. For babies, additional symptoms can include them refusing to feed, a stiff or unresponsive body, and a bulging soft spot on the top of their heads. One symptom often associated with meningitis is a red or purple spotty rash that quickly spreads all over the body. The rash will still be visible if a glass is pressed onto the skin. It is important to point out that symptoms can present in any order and that waiting for the rash if the other symptoms are present is not the correct call. To this day, there are approximately 2.5 million cases and a quarter of a million deaths each year. Early recognition and treatment is therefore vital, as the longer the disease is left untreated, the more damage can be done to those who survive. A person may require amputation of limbs or be left with brain damage even if they do survive. Hospital treatment is the best cause of action, as should complications arise, it is best to be monitored. For bacterial infections which are often more dangerous, antibiotics, steroids and fluids will be provided. With viral meningitis, treatment is usually not required at the hospital, though it is vital to establish whether it is viral or bacterial meningitis. A diagnosis can be done through blood tests or with a lumbar puncture. A lumbar puncture is the process of inserting a thin, hollow needle between the bones of the lower back and taking a sample of the cerebrofluid for testing. The history of meningitis might date back as far as observations made by Hippocrates. Another comes from Thomas Willis, an early pioneer in understanding the brain and nervous system. He noted patients who had an inflammation of the meninges with a continual fever in 1661. In 1805, the first recorded outbreak of meningitis took place in Geneva and was recorded by a general practitioner named Jespard Viuso. During this outbreak, patients were treated with ways that would attempt to relieve the pressure of the inflammation. Bloodletting through leeches and induced vomiting were used as an attempt to treat the patients. It wasn't until 1887 that Austrian doctor Anton Fekelsbaum that a bacterial infection was linked to the cause of meningitis. The next major breakthrough came in 1891, 
a way to diagnose meningitis. During the 20th century, efforts were made to isolate and identify the many pathogens that lead to meningitis. As for the prevention of the disease, one of the more common ways is through vaccination. Infants are given a vaccine for the HIV vaccine that has all but eliminated one previous common cause of meningitis in countries where the vaccine is used. In the United Kingdom, the MenB vaccine is given to infants in their 8-week, 16-week and 1-year jabs. This protects against the meningococcal group B bacteria, which are a common cause of meningitis in young children in the United Kingdom. Vaccines have since become a prerequisite for Muslims wishing to complete their Hajj, following a devastating outbreak of meningitis traced to the pilgrimage. Vaccines are also available to young adults in the United Kingdom in the form of the MEN ACWY vaccine. It is typically offered to teenagers around the age of 14 until the age of 25. The goal of this is to avoid the spread of meningitis at universities, where new students are at a higher risk of infection due to the close mixing with a large number of new people. Today, meningitis is prevalent in what is known as the meningitis belt in Africa, stretching from Gambia to Ethiopia. The meningitis belt of sub-Saharan Africa has the highest rates of meningococcal disease in the world. It is suspected that the low rainfall in this region allows for the greater spread. Those with a compromised immune system and those living in unsanitary conditions such as refugees are more at risk of contracting the disease. In 2020, the WHO set out the roadmap for defeating meningitis by 2030, which received unanimous support from the member states. The key goal is to rid the world of bacterial epidemics throughout the widespread use of affordable vaccines, improved access to care, and better disease surveillance. Like many of the diseases we have covered on this channel, the disparity between developed and the developing world is ever-present. Meningitis will remain a terrifying disease due to the wide number of pathogens that can lead to a quick death. It is a disease that will be a constant source of panic for new parents, and for good reason. It is vital we understand the symptoms and the need to act quickly. Whilst the majority of deaths are very young, it is important to never forget that it can affect anyone of any age. We would like to end this video with a different, more personal note. Unlike many of the diseases we have covered on this channel, our family has been tragically affected by meningitis. Last year, our 19-year-old cousin passed away from the disease. The reason for this video is to raise awareness of the symptoms of meningitis and to act as a reminder that it can affect young adults too. Whether through this video or through other materials, we sincerely hope you will be part of recognising a potentially deadly disease and avoid further tragedy. Few diseases can claim to have had such a large impact on humanity as malaria. The death tolls are staggering at around 2 million a year, with hundreds of children dying from the disease each day. It is a disease that we have known about for centuries. With treatments and methods of prevention developed proving effective, though some were incredibly damaging. Yet for much of the world, notably Sub-Saharan Africa, malaria remains a devastating disease. In today's video, we will cover the malaria life cycle, its destructive impact, and what is being done to combat the disease. Malaria is rightly linked to mosquitoes, though it's important to understand the role that mosquitoes play. Female mosquitoes of the genus Anopheles are the vector by which the parasitic organism named Plasmodium is able to spread. It is only the female mosquitoes that bite and drain blood, injecting the malaria parasite as they do so into the human host. These mosquitoes are found across much of the world, though these days they are very much limited to tropical areas and sub-Saharan Africa. These mosquitoes have a preference for human blood, meaning they are an effective spreader of the disease. What's more, they will lay their eggs in all manner of stagnant water sources, from marshes and swamps, to wells and cisterns. 
and even puddles. There are four types of plasmodium that are transmitted by mosquitoes that can cause malaria. Plasmodium is a single-celled organism that will infect a mosquito's saliva glands. When the infected female mosquito bites and drains the blood of a human host, it will also inject sporozoite of the plasmodium. These sporozoites are the spore-like stages of the parasite's life cycle and are capable of movement. They will make their way to the infected person's liver, where they will begin to reproduce asexually. The malaria parasite will begin to reproduce within the liver cells, until the point that they reach a critical mass and rupturing the cell, releasing more of the organisms to continue to infect more liver cells. The next goal of the malaria parasite is to enter the host's bloodstream. It is in the blood that the male and female gametocytes will begin to be produced. This is in the same manner as in the liver, but this time infecting and bursting the red blood cells. It is through the destruction of the red blood cells that a person will begin to feel the symptoms of malaria. Once the gametocytes are in the bloodstream, an uninfected mosquito can then suck the blood from an infected person, also consuming the malaria parasites. It is within the mosquito that the malaria parasites will reproduce sexually. The subsequent sporozoites then being ready to be injected into another host. And thus, the cycle starts over again. Once a person is infected, it can be very difficult for the cycle of infections to be broken, as the mosquitoes will continue to infect the population. As for the symptoms, the infected person will start to notice these within 7 to 30 days of infection. The usual symptoms are fevers, chills and sweating, and will often come in a series of bouts hours at a time fluctuating between feeling hot and cold. Vomiting, muscle aches and diarrhea are the other signs of infection. The problem is these symptoms can be mild and may be seen as something far less serious than malaria. For children, the danger is heightened as they tend to have more general symptoms such as fever, cough and diarrhea, often resulting in a misdiagnosis. Malaria can also cause anemia, exhaustion and jaundice as a result of the destruction of the host's red blood cells. Without treatment, kidney failure, seizures and death can occur. Whilst evidence would suggest that malaria was brought to the Americas as part of the Columbian Exchange or through the transatlantic slave trade, it would be in South America that a potential cure was discovered. Spanish missionaries learned that various fevers and chills were being treated by the indigenous people of modern-day Ecuador with a powder derived from the bark of the cinchona tree. Jesuit priests would use the powder for treating malaria where it proved to be effective. These priests would take their newly found knowledge and provide cures for the elites of Europe. With this secret, seemingly miraculous cure, the wider world had access to what would be the first effective treatment, as the bark of the so-called fever tree contained quinine. In high enough quantities, quinine can provide relief for a person infected with malaria, as it can stop the parasites from growing and by killing them. Quinine was often taken with water, creating what was known as a tonic. This tonic water, whilst providing a level of protection, was a bitter concoction. As a result, the British colonials in India began to mix the tonic with lemon, lime and gin. We therefore have malaria to thank for the invention of arguably the second best cocktail, the gin and tonic. Quinine, however, does have a number of side effects, notably tinnitus, deafness, and vision impairment. Whilst a cure for the disease was found and refined, malaria was not readily understood for many more centuries. It was not until 1897 that British doctor Ronald Ross proved that mosquitoes transmitted the malaria parasite responsible for the disease. This built upon work and research done by Patrick Mason, who was the first to identify that mosquitoes could transmit pathogens in their bites, and hypothesized that mosquitoes were responsible too for malaria. Once it was confirmed that mosquitoes could transmit malaria, the question then arose just how best to combat the disease. Two general solutions were given. 
deal with the parasites once in the human body, or to deal with the mosquitoes. This can perhaps be best seen in the various works undertaken in the United States during the 1930s. Vast public works set about draining much of the habitat of the mosquitoes, such as mill ponds and swamps. When combined with better access to affordable healthcare, malaria cases in the United States started to decline. But perhaps the most controversial of the methods employed was the use of DDT. DDT, or dichlorodiphenyl trichlorothane, was identified as a potent insecticide in the 1930s. Field tests of the chemical proved that it remained effective weeks after the initial spraying. The National Malaria Eradication Program began in 1947 and was overseen by the newly created CDC, or the Center for Disease Control. More than 6.5 million homes were sprayed with DDT. The drive to drain mosquito habitats continued, often accompanied by the spraying of DDT sometimes from aeroplanes. To provide an example of the effectiveness of this program, in 1947, some 15,000 malaria cases were reported. By 1951, malaria was eliminated altogether from the United States. However, this did come at a cost. The fallout from the spray of DDT resulted in the thinning of bird shells, and therefore declines in bird populations such as the bald eagle, the osprey, and the brown pelican. DDT is also considered a likely carcinogen in humans as well as causing issues with both male and female reproduction. Whilst the impact of malaria on modern history is profound, this is not the full story. The earliest evidence of malaria was found in ancient Egypt. DNA of malaria parasites have been found in the tissues of mummies, as well as evidence of large quantities of garlic being consumed to ward off mosquitoes. Malaria was also known for a time as the Roman fever referring to a particularly deadly strain of malaria that was found in the Pontine marshes. It is even postulated that an epidemic of malaria in the 5th century may have played a part in the downfall of the Roman Empire. It was during the European Renaissance that malaria was given its name, being Italian for bad air, the belief that it was spread by toxic air or vapours. This was in line with the miasma theory of disease, which stated that many diseases were born through the air, notably through bad smells. It has been speculated that one of the reasons that enslaved Africans were brought to the Americas in such great numbers was in part due to their resistance to malaria, especially when compared to European workers or those held under indentured servitude. In the southern colonies where malaria was rampant, plantation owners would exploit African slaves and reap the benefit of a labour force far more resilient to malaria. In the north colonies, there was little need for large numbers of such malaria-resistant labourers. Whilst this is but one theory behind the development of the transatlantic slave trade, it is interesting to take into account the role that malaria played in major historical events. Whilst many warlords, conquerors and armies have doubtlessly laid low many opposing forces, it is hard to ignore the role that malaria has played in conflicts throughout history. It is believed by some historians that Alexander the Great succumbed to malaria, along with Oliver Cromwell and Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan is thought to have suffered from malaria-like fevers only a few months before his death but it was the common soldier who would often suffer from malaria due to living in squalid, overcrowded camps. Malaria has also played a role in slowing or even stopping many an army. Attila the Hun's invasion of the Roman Empire was said to have been stopped by Pope Leo I, but the Huns were undoubtedly already weakened by the Roman fever. For the British Empire during the Revolutionary War, the southern colonies were rife with malaria. British troops deployed to these regions had little in the way of experience in dealing with the disease. In 1780, the British colonial forces were bested by a malaria epidemic, which would take out entire forts at a time and at its peak affecting around half of the British troops. During the Second World War, malaria was a constant battle that was waged for troops in the Pacific theatre. 
The need for malaria-free soldiers was a major reason for the works undertaken to rid the United States of malaria and to obtain medications that would be effective at combating the disease. Before the onset of World War II, the Dutch had a monopoly on the production of quinine, having grown vast quantities of the trees in their colonial holdings in Java, and holding much of the quinine in warehouses in the Netherlands. With the occupation of both the Netherlands by Nazi Germany, and the occupation of Java by Imperial Japan, the Allies lost access to a vital drug and needed a replacement. The preferred anti-malaria drug used by the Allies was quinacrine, otherwise known as atabrin. However, this drug did have some rather nasty side effects, meaning that the troops would not take the medicine. The most common side effects were headaches, diarrhea, and sickness, with some even experiencing their skin turning an off-yellow colour. Today, malaria remains a major threat. According to the latest figures, there were 241 million cases of malaria in 2020, which was up from 227 million cases in 2019. Around 627,000 people died of malaria in 2020 alone. The vast majority of deaths occurred in the African continent, with around 80% of these deaths being children. Insecticide is still a widely used method of dealing with mosquitoes, though debate still exists as to the use of DDT. The use of anti-malaria drugs is now only one part of the story, as the parasite has developed drug resistance, particularly in Southeast Asia. These harder strains become more prevalent and new drugs are needed to fight back. It is therefore vital that surveillance and understanding the genetic makeup of the parasite strains is used in addition to other methods of control. A vaccine known as the RTS is now being rolled out in order to increase a person's tolerance to the disease. Some of the greatest success can be seen in Senegal. In the year 2000, the rates of malaria infections were as high as 250 infections per 1,000 people. By 2020, it had fallen to just 50 infections per thousand people. It has been through genetic mapping, better understanding of the disease amongst the population, and through better access to healthcare that Senegal has seen a decline in cases and deaths. Malaria has long been a dangerous and debilitating disease for humanity. Whilst there have been successes, there is still plenty more to be done to eliminate the disease. The rise of anti-resistant parasites is certainly alarming, but it is not without hope. Of all the diseases that have plagued humanity, very few carry such a heavy stigma as leprosy. Even the word conjures images of the untouchable, the unclean, and those who lose body parts. Though in reality, it is a very different disease. It is an illness that is perhaps not widely understood, yet is widely known about, with myths and prejudice clouding what the disease truly means for those who are affected. Whilst you may believe that the disease is from a bygone medieval age, it still affects around 200,000 people per year. In today's video, we will cover the history of leprosy, how we have sought to combat the disease, and how we have treated those who were affected by such a horrendous illness. Leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease, is an infectious illness that primarily affects a person's skin and the peripheral nervous system. It is caused by the bacteria Mycobacterium leprae. It cannot be spread by casual contact, such as shaking hands or merely sitting near an infected person nor can it be spread via sexual contact or spread in the utero. Leprosy is mainly spread via airborne droplets, often through coughing or sneezing by someone who is affected by the disease. Infection rates will vary depending on the health of those exposed. Leprosy will tend to only infect those with a poor immune system, those who are malnourished, and those who live in poor conditions. What's more, around 95% of people are naturally immune to leprosy, meaning the disease will never affect most people. Even when infected, the disease is so slow to reproduce that it can take years for symptoms to come to light. It is important to note that whilst we have some idea as to how the disease spreads, we are still not 100% certain. 
This is because the disease is difficult to grow outside of a living body, making it very difficult to study. It is important to start with the myth that leprosy can cause the loss of limbs, toes or fingers, or that flesh will simply fall away from the body. This is not the case. Leprosy is not a flesh-eating bacterium that will devour a person's body. Rather, the infection damages the skin and nervous system, which will often result in a person losing all sensation in the hands and feet. Often, cuts and damage to the extremities will go unnoticed, leading to infections that if untreated will cause damage. The digits on a person's hand can however be reabsorbed by the body, giving the impression they have fallen off. Corneal ulcers or blindness can also occur if facial nerves are affected due to loss of sensation of the eye. Leprosy often results in lesions on the skin. Other signs of advanced leprosy can also include the loss of eyebrows and nose deformity from damage to the nasal septum. In men, the testicles can also be damaged, resulting in infertility. Leprosy is perhaps one of the oldest illnesses that has affected humanity. There is evidence that leprosy was active in the Indian subcontinent as early as 2000 BCE. Leprosy was identified as a disease as early as 600 BCE, both by Indian and Chinese doctors. It is thought that one of the first vectors for the disease to spread were the armies of Alexander the Great from his invasion of India in the 4th century BCE. From there, it was spread to North Africa before being picked up by the Roman Empire. As the disease was not widely understood, many ill-devised treatments were developed to deal with leprosy. One such treatment involved bathing in the blood of lambs, children or virgins as a form of purification ritual, as it was believed that the disease was a punishment from God for some sin. Other doctors attempted the use of venoms and poisons to kill the infection, but by far the most horrific solution to leprosy patients was the implementation of leper colonies. At this point, it is perhaps important to note that the term leper is no longer the accepted term for a person suffering with leprosy, due to the treatment and practices of the leper colonies. Such colonies became widespread during the Middle Ages and were used to contain and quarantine leprosy patients, as well as others suffering from a variety of other skin conditions. These colonies would be built in isolated areas away from the rest of the populations and were often run by the church. The goal of the colony would be to separate the affected from the healthy as a means to stop the spread of the disease. Leprosy patients would be made to wear clothing that marked them as lepers, and would be made to carry a bell to warn others of their proximity. Many leper or lazar houses were established in England between the 11th and 14th centuries. Often, the patients would beg for food and money in exchange for praying for those who would donate to the religious orders. The stigma of those shunned by the community combined with the misconceptions about the disease resulted in the use of such colonies until very recently. One notable example is Kalu Papa, a small Hawaiian island that was designated as a leper colony following the enactment of a law that marked patients as little more than criminals. Despite being enacted in the 1960s, the state of Hawaii did not repeal the law until 1969. Even to this day, the island has not been developed. With those who remain on the island, who are well into their 70s and 80s, left unable to reintegrate into society. A link in the description will be available that looks into the consequences of this policy for those who wish to read more. Not all that suffered from leprosy would be outcast. One of the most famous leprosy patients was King Baldwin IV of Jerusalem. As a child, it was clear that he had contracted the illness though was not formally diagnosed as to avoid the stigma. As the only son, his accession was tolerated by the ruling elites. Despite having no feeling in his right arm, Baldwin was able to lead his armies against Saladin and his Saracen forces, successfully defeating them in five engagements and taking part in the fighting himself. In today's world, we now have access to medications and treatment for leprosy, though it is vital that such intervention happens as soon as possible.
The telltale sign of numbness or loss of feeling ought to be referred to a doctor as soon as possible. It is then the case of taking a number of antibiotic drugs together in what is known as a multi-drug treatment to deal with the bacteria. It is when the illness is left untreated that major damage can be inflicted. The disease is most commonly found in India, Brazil and Indonesia, with more than half of all new cases of leprosy being diagnosed in India. Very often, the stigma of the disease results in people, particularly women and girls, not wishing to disclose their symptoms for fear of being shunned. As a result, the disease will go untreated and progress to a stage that is debilitating. Whilst the Indian government has developed and distributes a vaccine, it does not offer a full level of protection. The World Health Organization is working to reduce the impact and spread of leprosy, with the two key components being to combat the stigma and ensure the early treatment. Early detection and the treatment will result in fewer people developing more debilitating symptoms. In stopping the stigma associated with leprosy, more and more people will be willing to seek help, which will go hand in hand with early detection. Whilst we have come a long way from leper colonies and not understanding the illness, there is still more work to be done. There is no doubt that plenty of you would have held misconceptions about the disease, but it is through better understanding that we can look to remove the stigma which will set us on the right path to eliminating the disease. The stigma of leprosy has undoubtedly caused a great deal of unnecessary suffering, and whilst it can be somewhat understood when we had little to no idea about the disease, we have today a much better understanding. I would invite you all to look further into the work that has been done to rid the world of the disease and the consequences of shaming those affected. Links will be available in the description for those who wish to look further. Despite being a relatively new illness, Ebola manages to strike fear into the hearts of many. It conjures images of extreme pain and suffering, of the 2014 epidemic in West Africa and of hazmat-clad health workers putting their lives on the line. Ebola is a widely misunderstood illness, one surrounded by myths elevating the disease to apocalyptic levels. That is not to say that the disease does not pose a huge risk to many. In today's video, we will cover the history of Ebola, the pandemics that define the terror related to the disease and what is being done to better combat the virus. Ebola is a viral hemorrhagic fever meaning it is capable of causing failure of the patient's organ systems and damages the cardiovascular system, rendering the body incapable of functioning on its own. The first notable symptoms of Ebola are a sore throat, muscle aches, and fever and or chills. Soon, symptoms will include vomiting, diarrhea, rashes, and kidney failure. Around this stage, a patient will often begin to hemorrhage, both internally and externally. It is important to note that only when symptoms start to appear is when a patient becomes contagious. Therefore, identifying and recognizing the symptoms is vital for containment of the disease. The Ebola virus will spread amongst non-human primate species and bats for much of the time. This is what is known as a natural reservoir for the virus. The bats that carry the virus will not suffer any of their symptoms previously mentioned, allowing for infection into humans at any given time. In what is termed as a spillover event, Ebola is transmitted through all manner of infected fluids, including the usual vectors of blood, urine and saliva. It is also capable of being spread via semen, breast milk, vomit and sweat. If the virus can enter a person's body through an open cut or through the eyes, nose or mouth, the infection will take hold. Once infected with the Ebola virus, it will incubate for anywhere from 2 to 21 days. Once in the body, it will attack the immune system, destroying cells and leaving the patient with little in the way of detecting or combating the virus. One key target for the Ebola virus are the dendritic cells. 
These cells are found in the immune system and in essence absorb viruses. They give instructions to the immune system to produce specific antibodies for the pathogen. In targeting these early warning system cells, the Ebola virus is able to trick the host into not producing antibodies. The Ebola virus will enter the bloodstream and the lymphatic system before spreading throughout the whole body. For many patients, there will be a large number of leaks in the blood vessels caused by damage to the cells, leaving the patient with no blood pressure, drastic drops in body temperature and the body entering into a state of shock. For others, they will succumb to Ebola following the destruction of too many of their cells, which can trigger an extreme autoimmune response that is damaging to the host in what is termed a cytokine storm. The body launches an all or nothing attempt to rid the body of the virus with drastic measures employed. Such measures will damage the blood vessels further, thinning the blood, causing the patient to bleed internally and externally. Once a person dies from Ebola, usually from blood loss and the associated complications, the patient's body is at its most contagious. Extra precautions need to be taken when dealing with the body, with all contaminated clothing and bedding carefully disposed of. Specialist teams are employed to carefully and respectfully bury the bodies of the dead to avoid any further spreading of the disease. As simple as it may sound, one of the best ways to avoid the spread of Ebola is to ensure hands are washed thoroughly throughout the day. The first case of Ebola dates to 1976 and took place in the town of Nazara in Sudan, which is now modern-day southern Sudan. The very first patient was a cotton factory worker who at first was thought to have contracted malaria, not realising it was a novel disease. Two more workers at the same factory soon became ill with the same illness, all three succumbing to Ebola. In total, the initial outbreak resulted in 284 cases, resulting in 151 deaths. A deadly hemorrhagic fever presented a new problem, along with a mortality rate of over 50%. For those who survived, recovery was slow and arduous. It's believed that the initial infections took place in the cotton factory, likely from contact with bats that dwelt in the rafters. Towards the end of 1976, 318 cases with 280 deaths occurred in Zaire which is the modern-day Democratic Republic of Congo. These outbreaks were two entirely different strains and not at all related to one another, but signalled the arrival of a new, incredibly deadly disease. It was from the second outbreak in Zaire that the disease would gain its name. The initial patient had gone on a business trip near the Ebola River. For the next few years, a handful of cases would occur mainly in Central Africa, Gabon and Uganda soon joined the list of countries affected, but it was in December of 2013 that a shocking outbreak would begin that would take hold within West Africa. The first patient is believed to be a young toddler in Guinea. It is understood he consumed bushmeat infected with the virus. Soon after, he and his entire immediate family died. By January of 2014, a medical emergency was declared. The Ebola virus had largely remained in rural areas but was now taking hold in major cities. A lack of meaningful tracking of the disease and an ill-prepared and poor healthcare infrastructure led to the spreading of Ebola to the neighbouring countries of Liberia and Sierra Leone in July of 2014. On the 8th of August 2014, the situation in West Africa was officially declared as a public health emergency of international concern by the WHO. In the following months, Ebola in a limited way was able to spread to Mali, Senegal and Nigeria. A number of Western healthcare workers who had spent time in West Africa had contracted the virus and brought the disease home. This in turn sparked fears that Ebola would soon take hold all around the world and with the high mortality rates cause a huge loss of life. But soon enough, the affected West African countries started to declare themselves Ebola free. 
by gaining the support of local leaders in disseminating proper prevention, and with the coordinated implementation of healthcare policy, the spread of the virus was reduced and the outbreak was brought to an end. By the end of the epidemic, some 28,600 people had been infected, with 11,310 dead. Due to the pandemic caused by the fear of Ebola outbreaks in the West, a number of misunderstandings arose. The high fatality rates can be attributed to a lack of proper medical attention. If caught early enough, a patient has a better chance of survival by providing basic medical interventions. The giving of intravenous fluids and medications to deal with the low blood pressure, vomiting and diarrhea greatly improves the chance of survival. Sadly, such treatment proved too costly for many patients, and the lack of adequate medical facilities only made matters worse. One major fear attributed to Ebola is that it might mutate to become an airborne disease. Many point out just how devastating the illness would be if it did mutate, as in its present form, containment is far easier. However, no virus that affects humans has ever changed its mode of transmission. For example, the idea that the HIV virus might become airborne is not something that is given much thought. In terms of combating the Ebola outbreaks, one major method will be managing the interactions with animals that carry the virus. The consumption of bushmeat has been linked to the introduction of the disease into humans, and so education around the dangers of eating primates is vital. If Ebola does enter the human population, the use and proliferation of personal protective equipment, robust hygiene measures, and decent healthcare facilities will work to stop the spread and save lives. As our technology develops, the monitoring of genetic changes and contact tracing will help limit the devastation. These methods cost money, but for those fearful of airborne mutations, it's surely a small price to pay. Whilst Ebola is no doubt a deadly disease, it is very much limited by its transmission methods. Containment does prove to be effective, and those at highest risk of contracting the disease are healthcare workers and friends and family of an infected person. Yet, even with a low comparative death toll to other illnesses, Ebola will likely remain as a disease that is feared, and one that is not well understood. I would invite you all to read a little further into the disease, as it is through understanding that we can better combat illnesses that would otherwise run rampant. This man could tell you a lot about asbestos now. If only he'd known asbestos is so dangerous, he needed a respirator and other protective devices to be safe. If only every worker and employer knew that the asbestos installed in the past is still there today. And if only there were a cure. Few minerals can cause as much fear as one of the most widely used minerals throughout human history, asbestos. Its use has been recorded some 4,500 years ago, has been used by pharaohs and kings, and played a vital role during the Industrial Revolution. But exposure to tiny asbestos fibres can lead to deadly cancers and chronic lung illnesses. It can be years or even decades before exposure to asbestos presents in truly horrendous illness. In today's video, we will cover exactly what asbestos actually is, how it can affect you, and the history of its application to its eventual limiting of use. Asbestos is a catch-all term for six types of fibrous silicate mineral. Generally speaking, there are two major types of asbestos. They are chrysotile or white asbestos and amosite, brown asbestos. Asbestos is noted for its heat resistance, for its properties as an electrical insulator, and when mixed with other materials can act as a strengthening agent. Asbestos consists of long, thin fibre-like crystals. These fibres themselves are made of microscopic fibres. It's these that cause harm to those who breathe them in. When asbestos is cut, chipped or otherwise disturbed, these microscopic fibres can be released as a fine dust. Such dust can linger in an area for days before settling, 
providing a deadly airborne risk. If breathed in, the asbestos fibers can enter a person's lungs, where the body can have great difficulty removing them, if at all. The sharp fibers lodged into a person's lungs result in scarring, a reduction in a person's lung capacity, and inflammation. No amount of exposure to asbestos is considered safe, but following repeated exposure to asbestos can lead to a high risk of contracting many deadly conditions. Chief amongst them is asbestosis. Over time, following repeated exposure and damage caused by the lodged fibers builds up to a point where the scarring and inflammation leads to a shortness of breath. Other symptoms include a persistent cough, chest pains, and fatigue. These symptoms can take decades after the exposure to present, as the reduction of a person's lung capacity will slowly degrade as the fibers repeatedly damage the lungs. The body's immune system will constantly attempt to deal with a foreign body, resulting in the tissue scarring and plaques forming in the lungs. Unfortunately, there is no current cure for asbestosis. There are only treatments to help reduce its impact. A patient can undergo oxygen therapy to help improve breathlessness or take part in rehabilitation exercises, but it will be a case of living with the condition. Another disease associated with asbestosis is pleural mesothelinoma, a cancer that affects the lining of the lungs. Symptoms again are similar to asbestosis, but they also include a loss of appetite, unexplained weight loss, and high temperature, particularly at night. The disease usually affects a person from the age of 60 or so on. Treatments will be what you might expect for cancers, being chemotherapy and radiotherapy, though surgery is perhaps an option only at very early stages. As for the history of asbestos, one of the first examples can be found in Finland some 4,500 years ago. There it was mixed with clay and used to form stronger, more heat-resistant pots. In ancient Greece, asbestos cloths were used to wrap around the dead before cremation. As asbestos is highly flame resistant, the ashes from the wood and the body would not be mixed. Instead, the ashes kept safely in the asbestos shroud. In ancient Egypt, the embalmed bodies of the pharaohs would be wrapped in asbestos to help protect them from deteriorating. Whilst it may seem strange with our present knowledge, asbestos cloth was used as a party trick. Napkins and tablecloths would be soiled during feasts before being thrown into fires to cleanse them without taking any damage, such a trick being favoured by Charlemagne. It was known early enough that asbestos presented some form of danger. Pliny the Elder, a renowned Roman philosopher and author, wrote about the disease of slaves that affected the lungs of those unfortunate enough to have to mine asbestos. He also noted that some of the miners would wear a thin membrane made from the bladder of a goat as a form of respirator to try and protect themselves from the asbestos. But the boom in the use of asbestos would come during the Industrial Revolution. With the widespread use of steam power and electricity, asbestos was used as an insulator in all manner of engines, boilers and generators. Mines in Canada, Russia, Australia and Zimbabwe fueled a huge industry, and as the mines became mechanised, tens of thousands of tonnes of asbestos were made available each year. One of the key industries that asbestos would end up in was construction. All manner of building materials were produced containing or made from asbestos. Fireproof tiles, tar and insulation would all contain it, offering a cheap and apparently safe way to build houses. With asbestos prevalent in so many industries, it didn't take long for doctors to start to find a link between workers exposed to the mineral and lung disease. In 1898, a British government report on asbestos manufacturing in England noted widespread damage and injury of the lungs due to the dusty surrounding of the asbestos mill. In 1906, British doctor H. Montague Murray conducted a post-mortem of a worker from an asbestos factory. He noted a large number of asbestos fibres lodged in the man's lungs. By 1908, a number of insurance companies began to subtly reduce insurance coverage whilst increasing premiums for asbestos workers. Yet the focus was very much still on the widespread use of asbestos in many industries, with hundreds of thousands of people exposed to the dangers, both at work and at home. However, with the prevalence of other respiratory diseases such as tuberculosis, many of those affected by asbestos may have attributed their symptoms to other illnesses. It was not until 1924 that the first death was attributed to asbestosis. 
Nellie Kershaw was a 33-year-old textile worker from Rochdale, England when she died. She had suffered from symptoms for four years, but as her illness was linked to an occupational disease, she was unable to claim on the National Health Service Insurance. Instead, she had to rely on sickness benefits from her employer. However, her employer, the Turner Brothers Asbestos Company, did not pay out, as asbestos poisoning was not a recognised industrial illness. In fact, they strongly protested that asbestos could be poisonous. Nellie Kershaw died without receiving any compensation. Her death did, however, trigger a post-mortem inquest. Whilst her death was initially ruled as TB, further investigations revealed microscopic asbestos fibres in her lungs. This was deemed to be the true cause of her death. This in turn led to a parliamentary investigation which ultimately led to the first asbestos industry regulations in 1931. Asbestos, however, continued in its widespread use. In fact, many of you will have seen asbestos without even realising it. During the scene in The Wizard of Oz where the main characters are asleep in the poppy field, the fake snow is in fact chrysotile asbestos. After the devastation of the Second World War, a need for rapid rebuilding led to the widespread use of prefabricated buildings. One of the materials used was asbestos. During the Cold War, asbestos was used in much of the military hardware made. In the 1950s, a number of reports were published in England, Germany and America, all detailing the instances of lung cancer amongst asbestos workers. Asbestos industry-funded studies that confirmed a causal link between exposure and lung disease were not widely shared or even published. But in 1953, Dr. Richard Doll was tasked by Turner Brothers Asbestos Company to study the mortality data of a group of its workers. The data that was provided, however, was tailored by the company. But nevertheless, Dr. Doll was able to identify an above-average number of lung cancer cases, with it being ten times more prevalent than the rest of the population. The Turner Brothers Asbestos Company attempted to prevent the publishing of the report, Thankfully, Dr. Doll and the editor of the journal pressed ahead and published a paper, yet it would take decades for any meaningful change to occur. The 1970s proved to be the peak of asbestos use, with hundreds of thousands of tons of asbestos used in all manner of industries. But around this time, the general public started to understand and see the link between exposure to asbestos and the devastating lung diseases it caused. More and more people were displaying signs of asbestosis, following years of exposure. The effectiveness, the low cost and widespread use of asbestos was no longer the major factor in its use. No longer could governments ignore the dangers of asbestos. In the UK, it wouldn't be until 1985 that the import and use of blue and brown asbestos was banned. Chrysotile asbestos would not be banned until 1999. Many countries started to ban or limit the use of asbestos in the 1980s, and as of today, there are 66 countries that have banned or limited the use of asbestos. But this of course does not mean that the millions of tons of asbestos disappeared overnight. In many a location, asbestos lay hidden within the wall cavities, within the concrete or on roofs of countless buildings. During refurbishments and demolitions of buildings, there could be a risk of asbestos being disturbed. As discussed previously, the danger lies when asbestos is cut, broken or otherwise disturbed. The deadly fibres can be released and inhaled. Your humble narrator was working as a labourer in Sydney not too long ago, and I witnessed firsthand just how easy it is to be exposed to asbestos in such a manner. In Australia, the cheap and readily available blue asbestos was used in much of the construction, sometimes without proper planning permission or notice that asbestos has been used. It was quite the shock when I knocked down a wall to come face to face with a honeycomb structure of asbestos fiberboard. I had been told that there was no asbestos left in the building. Such exposure is dangerous, though the real risk is prolonged or large exposure. It should go without saying that it is never worth the risk to be exposed to asbestos. Only those with proper training, equipment and protective gear ought to remove asbestos in a manner that is safe. Should you uncover any asbestos in your home, it is vital that you contact a trusted asbestos removal company. They will be able to deal with the matter safely. Methods of disposing asbestos can range from melting it down to a harmless state or sealing it in airtight containers and burying it. 
The dangers of asbestos contamination can perhaps best be seen in the case of Wittenoom, Australia. This was the site for Australia's only blue asbestos mine, but has since been delisted as a town. Patches of blue asbestos stain the ground, proving it a danger to those who lived there, though now the town has been abandoned. It is thought that as many as 237,000 people die each year from exposure to asbestos. Nevertheless, asbestos is still mined in Russia, China and Kazakhstan, and used in multiple countries. And you may be surprised to learn that commercial use of asbestos still continues in the United States, Brazil, Russia, India and many more countries. We know all too well of the dangers of asbestos, and yet for many, the risk to human health does not outweigh the benefits. Despite decades of scientific and medical consensus as to the dangers, it still took many more years for the countries who have banned asbestos to finally do so. Asbestos represents one of the greatest scandals in occupational health, with the steps taken to hide from the public the truth about one of the deadliest materials. And so, we suggest you consider this material for the walls of your home. Designed to last a lifetime. A trouble-free lifetime. There are few diseases that conjure such a strong image as anthrax. One of terror and of horrific potential. At some point in human history, the disease was able to jump from animals to humans where it became a constant source of misery, from wiping out livestock to killing thousands. It was one of the first diseases to be understood, and its discovery a key piece of evidence for germ theory. Some strains of the disease are known to have mortality rates as high as 90%, meaning many military scientists have sought to weaponize this lethal pathogen. In today's video, we will cover the history of the disease, how it was brought under some level of control, and how many have sought to weaponize a terrifying disease. Anthrax is caused by the Bacillus anthracis bacteria, which is found in soil all around the world. The spores of the bacteria are able to persist in the soil in a dormant state for many years, with some evidence stating it may be capable of being viable even after centuries. It is a disease that primarily affected animals, but at some point in history became capable of spreading from animals to humans. Anthrax, however, is not transmitted from human to human, save for exposure from infected material such as discharge from lesions. Once anthrax infects a person, it will begin to replicate and produce toxins, which will poison and ultimately kill the host. Anthrax infections can broadly be grouped into three kinds, gastrointestinal, cutaneous, and inhalation. These three infections will present some different symptoms. Gastrointestinal anthrax is usually caused by ingesting infected meat that has not been thoroughly cooked. An infected person will display diarrhea, abdominal pain or swelling, and fever and chills. Once in the gastrointestinal system, the bacteria can spread to the bloodstream and to the rest of the body. In today's world, such infections are incredibly rare, thanks to improvements in food production and preparation. But, where unhygienic practices are kept, the risk will remain. Cutaneous anthrax occurs when anthrax spores get into the skin normally through an open cut. Historically, this would occur with workers who handled infected animals or contaminated animal products, such as wool, hides or hair. Cutaneous anthrax will primarily present as a boil-like skin lesion, which is usually painless. This lesion will form an ulcer, which will soon become a black necrotic scab known as an eschar perhaps the most infamous sign of anthrax infection. With no treatment, around 23% of people with cutaneous anthrax will die, although with the proper treatment, the survival rate is very high. The final type, inhalation anthrax, is perhaps the scariest of the three. Inhalation anthrax can take anywhere from one to eight weeks to present. At first, an infected person will suffer from fever, chills and fatigue. 
The symptoms may be accompanied by coughing, shortness of breath, chest pains, and nausea. Such symptoms are indistinguishable from the flu. Often symptoms may die down for a period, lulling the patient into a false state of security. Over time, the infected person will struggle with their breathing, often accompanied with chest pains again. The bacteria will first infect the lymph nodes in the chest before targeting the lungs. This initial lymph node infection can often result in hemorrhagic metastinitis, where the chest cavity will fill with a bloody fluid affecting the person's breathing. Infection of the lungs can be very sudden, and from this point, an untreated person will usually die within 48 hours. All types of anthrax can be treated with antibiotics. As is often the case, the sooner the treatment, the more chance of survival. A number of previous illnesses and outbreaks today are attributed to anthrax. Anthrax is believed to have first appeared in the Middle East, notably Egypt and Mesopotamia. The description of one of the ten plagues of Egypt may have also been describing anthrax. The fifth plague, a pestilence that killed Egyptian livestock, does bear some similarities with anthrax. The English sweating sickness of the 15th and 16th century has also been attributed by some to the disease. However, others point to the hunter virus as the culprit. And in the early 1800s, an illness known as wool sorter's disease was common for those who worked in the wool industry, with infections taking hold in a person's cut hands. The first clinical description of anthrax was not until the 18th century. Bacillus anthracis was first identified by French microbiologist Casimir Devan in 1850. Devan was studying infected sheep and was able to identify that the bacteria could be transmitted from animal to animal. Though exactly how was discovered by German microbiologist Robert Koch and was published in 1876. Apologies to the German viewers for butchering the name. Robert identified the spores that spread the bacteria and they were capable of lying dormant for years at a time. His discovery was an important one, as he was the first scientist to prove a link between a microorganism and a disease it can cause. A major step in proving the theory of germ transmission of disease. It was Louis Pasteur who first developed the vaccine for anthrax, though it was only suitable for use in animals. In a dramatic display of the vaccine's efficacy, Pasteur vaccinated 25 animals, he then injected these animals and another 25 with anthrax. All the animals without the vaccine died, whilst all those with the vaccine survived. With the introduction of a vaccine for animals, cases of anthrax in humans dropped, as close contact with animals being one of the main reasons for infection. The vaccine was improved by Max Stern in 1937, which is today still the preferred method of vaccinating animals. As scientists sought to understand and fight the disease, many looked for ways to weaponize it. The efficacy of inhalation anthrax and its potency make it a desirable weapon of mass destruction. To put this into context, a mere one kilogram of aerosolized anthrax is capable of affecting a city of 10 million and result in around 100,000 deaths. One of the first instances of weaponizing anthrax can be seen during the First World War. It was reported that the German military shipped horses and cattle infected with anthrax to the Allied forces, with the goal of disrupting food, logistics and cavalry. In 1917, a Swedish military officer named Baron Otto Karl von Rossen travelled to Russia with a goal of infecting horses and reindeer used by the British Army. This would be done with sugar cubes, each containing a small glass vial filled with anthrax. Once fed to the animals, the glass would break, cutting the gums and causing anthrax infection. In 1925, the Geneva Convention banned the use of chemical or biological weapons, but this did not stop many countries from developing their weapons programs in these fields. Perhaps the most notable example can be found during the Chinese occupation of China in the 1930s. Unit 731 was set up to produce chemical and biological weapons, and live human captives were used as test subjects. 
one of our earliest videos, covers Unit 731 for those interested to learn more. But the development of weaponized anthrax was one of the many projects at the facility. Unit 731 deployed anthrax spores from planes in attacks on Chinese civilians. As many as 400,000 civilians were murdered as a result of the tests carried out by Unit 731. In 1942, the British, Canadian and American forces jointly developed their own anthrax research, led by the Porton Down Research Facility. It was realised that an area affected with anthrax would result in long-lasting contamination of the area with the spores. A bomb was developed and deemed a success, but was never used during World War II. The bomb was tested on Gruenide Island, and as a result the island was rendered inhospitable. Initial attempts to decontaminate the island failed. It was not until 1986 that the island was decontaminated. This was because of a militant group known as Dark Harvest, who delivered containers of the contaminated soil from the island to Porton Down and to the Conservative Party conference. Dark Harvest sought to bring to the authorities' attention a long ignored contamination, as opposed to actively infect anyone with the disease. For example, the sample that was delivered to the Conservative Party was not contaminated. Although, there are other groups who had much more murderous ideas. Ayum Shinrikyo, a Japanese doomsday cult, attempted to cultivate anthrax into a viable weapon. An attempt was made to steal a potent strain from a laboratory. Though in the end, they were only able to provide a vaccine strain of anthrax. In June of 1993, the cult sprayed a liquid suspension of the bacteria from atop their headquarter building in Tokyo, Japan. Thankfully, this did not have the desired effect, with no casualties and the group receiving a complaint for the action. Instead, the group would turn to sarin, launching attacks on the Tokyo subway system in 1995. Shortly after the September 11th terror attacks, a number of letters containing anthrax spores were sent to a number of people and media outlets. Before long, letters were sent to Democrat senators. In all, five people were killed, with the suspect responsible being Bruce Ivins, a biodefense researcher, ending his own life in 2008. But perhaps the deadliest anthrax outbreak can be traced to Sverdlovsk in 1979. Spores of the bacteria accidentally leaked from a Soviet military research facility. It is believed the leak occurred due to a faulty air handling system. Once out of the building, the spores were taken by the wind. At least 68 people are known to have died as a result, with many more infected. Those infected lived in rural villages nearby, as well as affecting workers of a ceramic factory. Despite the developments in antibiotics, vaccines and our understanding, anthrax will remain one of the scariest diseases, in large part due to its potential as a biological weapon. Whilst there have been limited instances of its use as a weapon, it will remain a byword for terror. With its 90% fatality rate, it truly earns its reputation. But it's important to look at the wider context. Anthrax is no longer a death sentence. The key vectors for infection have been reduced and we have a much better understanding. The key danger, however, remains with dormant strains, capable of lying in wait under the frozen tundra and permafrost, capable of reinfecting animals as the ice melts away. There are few illnesses in history that have carried such a stigma as AIDS and HIV. Human immunodeficiency virus and the subsequent illness it causes, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, are relatively recent additions to the diseases that have affected the human race, but have already claimed an estimated 36 million lives. The race to uncover the cause of a spate of illnesses first identified in otherwise healthy gay men Haemophiliacs and Haitian immigrants soon uncovered a virus that could afflict anyone. 
In today's video, we will cover just exactly how the HIV virus operates, how the AIDS epidemic shaped a generation, and what more needs to be done to combat the disease. HIV is a retrovirus, meaning that the virus inserts a copy of its own RNA genome into the DNA of an infected cell, ultimately altering the genome of the cell. The host cell then makes copies of the virus. This hijacking makes HIV difficult for a host's immune system to combat, but this is half of the story. HIV also targets the very cells that fight the infection, namely the CD4 T cells. The initial infection of HIV will feel much like any other illness, often presenting flu-like symptoms. This will last as long as it takes for the immune system to somewhat combat the illness. Though soon enough, the symptoms will fade. No further signs of infection will present itself for years and maybe even decades. During this time, however, the virus will destroy T-cells, weakening a person's immune system to the point where even minor infections can prove deadly. It is at the point where the T-cell level drops to less than 200 T-cells per microliter that a person is considered to have AIDS. The healthy level for T-cells is between 500 and 1,500 per microliter, highlighting just how much damage the HIV infection can inflict. Once a person develops AIDS, they are incredibly susceptible to what are termed opportunistic infections. Often with HIV and AIDS, the infections tend to be illnesses such as salmonella, pneumonia, or fungal infections, as well as some forms of cancer. These opportunistic infections are what kill the sufferer of AIDS, usually in a small period of time. A person can be infected by HIV through certain bodily fluids, notably blood, semen, vaginal fluid, and breast milk. It cannot be spread through touch, through the air, or by saliva. Transmission via infected blood is by far the most effective way the illness spreads. Sharing needles, unprotected sex, particularly anal sex, and blood transfusions are the most common ways the disease spreads. The disease can also pass between mother and fetus in the utero, and through breast milk. It was during the 1980s that strange diagnoses were identified in otherwise healthy gay men. Five cases of a rare pneumonia infection were identified in Los Angeles. Soon enough, other cities around the world were reporting similar outbreaks of obscure illnesses. One notable example were the high instances of Kaposi sarcoma, a type of cancer that causes lesions on the skin and usually a sign of a weakened immune system. In not only gay men, but in hemophiliacs, heroin users, and Haitian immigrants. Whilst these groups were identified as the main affected groups, the disease was also prevalent amongst all groups. The race was on to identify the cause of the illness. Evidence had already presented itself as to how the disease was able to spread. It was identified as able to spread through intercourse, as it had passed through an infected person and their partner, and through blood transfusions due to the number of haemophiliacs affected. In 1983, it was the French team of Francois Barry Senossi and Luc Montagnier who believed that a virus was responsible. This was because both fungal and bacterial antigens were screened for when blood was donated, but not for viruses. They were able to discover a retrovirus in patients with swollen lymph glands that attacked lymphocytes, a kind of blood cell that is very important to the body's immune system. They named their discovery Lymphodemopathy Associated Virus. In 1984, American Dr. Robert Gallo and his team published a number of reports in what they had discovered about the retrovirus we now know as HIV. And just how the virus came to infect humans was soon identified. In 1985, researchers at Harvard and at the New England Regional Primate Research Center identified a similar immunodeficiency illness in macaque monkeys. Other non-human primates were studied until it was discovered that chimpanzees were infected with a similar virus to HIV. It was therefore hypothesized that the infection occurred between human and chimpanzees, in what was dubbed the cut hunter hypothesis. It is believed that a hunter of bushmeat, that is meat from a chimpanzee, may have had infected blood enter an open wound or cut. 
From there, the virus was able to spread to others. It is now believed that the virus originated somewhere in the Congo region and that it spread to humans in the early 1900s. At this time, the Belgian colonial authorities occupied the Congo Basin. It is thought that the disease was able to spread via intercourse with the sex workers present at the major trading posts and through needles being reused. At the time, needles would have only been washed in alcohol. In the 1960s, a number of Haitian professionals moved to the region when Belgian Congo gained independence in order to help rebuild the country. It is thought that one of these professionals may have become infected with HIV and brought it to the Americas. From there, it is believed that the unscrupulous and unsanitary blood plasma donation centers that sold blood to the United States unknowingly led to infections. To demonstrate how far the HIV virus had spread, it was likely the cause of death of a man in St. Louis in 1969, as well as a Norwegian sailor who died in 1976. The virus then silently spread around the world until by the 1980s it became clear of its deadly impact. It is often incorrectly stated that patient zero in the United States was a Canadian air steward named Gaetan Dugas. In a 1984 study, Dugas was identified for his role in a cluster of infections in California, being labelled in the study as patient O, the O representing out of state. The study sought to identify the sexual partners of a number of gay men in California as to trace how they had been infected. Dugas would be given the moniker Patient Zero following the release of the book titled And the Band Played On, Politics, People and the AIDS Epidemic. In this book, Dugas was portrayed as the reason for the AIDS epidemic in the United States, painted as a villain of the story. Dugas, however, was at the centre of the web of encounters, as he had been able to provide details of many of his sexual partners, as opposed to the others who were only able to provide a handful at best. In 2016, analysis of blood from the time identified that Dugas was not the originator of the virus, but rather had been infected by the strain that was present already in the state. Dugas would die on the 30th of March 1984, aged only 32, from AIDS-related kidney failure. HIV and AIDS soon became tied directly to being a homosexual man, with Kaposi sarcoma being labelled as the gay cancer. In fact, before HIV and AIDS were formally identified, the illness was given the name GRID which stood for gay-related immune deficiency due to some of the first cases being uncovered in gay men. It is important to note that whilst the virus can and does infect anyone, certain groups are more at risk. Gay men engaging in unprotected intercourse are at a higher risk of contracting the virus. The virus is able to spread quickly as rectal tissues provide little obstacle for the virus to pass through and rectal tissues contain high amounts of CD4 T cells, the very cells that HIV targets for infection. A link in the description will be available for those who wish to read more about the higher risks of infection amongst gay men. Whilst HIV and AIDS were seen as a gay illness, in Uganda this was not the case. What was termed Slim Jim as a result of the weight loss associated with the illness, the virus spread quickly through heterosexual intercourse and from mother to fetus. The virus was soon seen by some as the disease that punished immoral behaviours, whether that be homosexuality, promiscuity or drug use. Those who contracted the disease were often shunned, discriminated against or subject to violence. This was only compounded by the discrimination experienced by the LGBT community, who at the time were fighting for civil rights and recognition under the law. It was only when cases such as Ryan White became known did perception start to change. Ryan was a haemophiliac who contracted the virus following a blood transfusion when he was just 13 years old. Ryan was expelled from his school despite posing no threat to his classmates. Ryan was seen by some as the innocent victim of the AIDS epidemic, as opposed to gay men or drug users who were by implication the guilty victims. Such comments were flatly rejected by Ryan and his family, with Ryan stating, I'm just like everyone else with AIDS, no matter how I got it. 
The fight to obtain assistance and respect during the AIDS crisis was waged by a number of bodies. Larry Kramer and seven others co-founded Gay Men's Health Crisis in 1982, one of the first organizations to raise money for research of the virus. In January of 1983, Ward 86 opened as the world's first dedicated outpatient clinic for people with AIDS. Ward 86 was located at San Francisco General Hospital. It provided a holistic, compassionate and dignified approach that set the standard for treatment. It was not until 1985 that President Ronald Reagan established a presidential commission into combating the AIDS crisis, and after years of inaction. In 1987, Princess Diana attended the opening of the UK's first specialist HIV and AIDS unit at London's Middlesex Hospital. At a time where people were being burned out of their homes and shunned by the world, Diana was eager to prove that those suffering with HIV and AIDS posed no threat and deserved compassion. Many AIDS patients and activists would protest and raise awareness by what were termed die-ins. Activists would lay down in the street, often holding placards in the shape of gravestones stating how they might die. Whether from a lack of empathy, or that they received the placebo drugs in a trial, or that the price of the retroviral drugs were prohibitively expensive. The idea was to force society to realise what it truly meant to have to remove the corpses of so many AIDS patients, and to bring to light what more needed to be done. As of now, HIV AIDS is no longer a death sentence, though this largely depends on where you happen to live. The development of heart, or highly effective antiretroviral therapy, means that a person's immune system can stop HIV from replicating, avoiding the final stages of AIDS ever developing. Messaging and awareness as to the dangers of the virus, such as the one from the start of this video, emphasised just how anyone could be affected by the illness. In Sub-Saharan Africa, millions live with HIV, with AIDS being one of the leading causes of death in the region. Around 35 to 40 million people currently live with HIV, but many also live with a stigma because of their condition. In the various videos we have made about the illnesses that have plagued humanity, it is often the case that stigmatisation and a lack of compassion prevent treatment. Such is the case with HIV and AIDS, where communities were declared morally incompatible and posed a medical danger to those not afflicted. Whilst our understanding as to how the disease spreads means we are able to better prevent it, and as our understanding grows as to treatments, we may work towards a world where the impact of HIV is diminished considerably. But what we must never diminish is our compassion towards our fellow humans. During the 14th century, a disease ravaged Asia, the Middle East and Europe whose devastation is unparalleled. It's estimated that between 100 and 150 million people died over a few short years, at a time where the world's population was around 350 million, making it the deadliest pandemic in recorded history. The bubonic plague was likely able to spread along the trade routes, both along the Silk Road and aboard merchant ships. Those infected by the plague would die in only a few days, often in extreme agony, unaware of the cause and unable to receive any meaningful treatment. In today's video, we will cover the Black Death, its symptoms and the devastating effect it had on so many. The Black Death, otherwise known as the Bubonic Plague, is caused by the bacteria Yersinia pestis. It is a disease that can affect both animals and humans, though it is predominantly found on rodents and their fleas. A person affected with the Bubonic Plague will suffer from fever, chills and fatigue, but the telltale symptoms are large black bubos on a person's lymph nodes, on their armpits groin and neck. These fill with dead blood and pus and will burst further spreading contamination. In addition to bubonic plague, pneumonic plague can develop, 
affecting the lungs and can be spread from person to person by infected droplets. And finally, there is septicemic plague, where the bacteria will replicate in the infected person's blood. It can be a complication of pneumonic or bubonic plague, though it is possible for it to occur without the other. The disease favours infecting and killing rats and other rodents. It is capable of wiping out an entire colony in just a few weeks. Fleas that would drink from the infected blood of the dead rats would remain and feast until another rodent or human strayed too close. And so, the cycle begins anew. It was likely through the spread of infected fleas and their rat hosts that the Black Death was able to spread throughout the world. Rats favoured the damp and dark holds of the merchant ships, the perfect vector for spreading the plague. Rats in turn thrived in the unsanitary conditions of human settlements. At the time, waste of all kind was often dumped into the streets with little in the way of sewers. The first known instance of the Black Death arriving in Europe can be dated to a siege of the port city of Kaffa on the Crimean Peninsula in 1346. The forces of the Mongol Golden Horde were beset with the bubonic plague and, in some early form of biological warfare, reportedly catapulted the corpses of the infected dead over the city walls. Whether or not this actually happened, it cannot be denied that the disease entered the city. Caught between the plague within the city and the Mongol forces at the gates, a number of Genoese traders fled by ships to the rest of Europe, calling at Constantinople, Sicily and northern Italy. As the ships would arrive at port, dockside workers would be greeted with a truly horrific sight. Sailors, both corpses and those dying from the disease displayed the black bubles marking them infected with the Black Death. The ships were held as it was established what was happening, though it was already too late. It was reported that even hearing the words of the infected was enough to transmit the disease. But by this point, the rats and fleas had been able to spread from the ship and began to infect the populations. This would be a story along the European coast, where trade ports and coastal settlements were infected. The speed in which the Black Death was able to spread is staggering considering the modes of transportation available. From the initial infection in Constantinople in May of 1347, by March the following year, most of Europe was under the effects of the Black Death. Only Iceland and Finland were spared from the disease. Once a town or settlement was infected, it would only be a matter of time for a large proportion of the population to be killed. For a time, a person will display no symptoms, yet will still be contagious. It would be far too late to quarantine the infected once they display symptoms. At the time, there was no understanding of germ theory with many incorrect beliefs persisting as to the cause and spread of the disease. You may have seen the iconic Plague Doctor masks with the hooked beak-like nose and flowing robes. Whilst you may associate this outfit with the Plague Doctors of the Black Death, such an outfit did not exist until the 16th century outbreak of the disease. The long-beaked nose would be filled with all manner of herbs and spices both to block out the smell of the rotting dead, who were often left in their homes to die alone. But it was also believed that the disease might spread through the foul odours. For the first outbreak, doctors relied on bloodletting and lacing the bubles to attempt to cure patients. It was believed at the time that proper levels of blood, bile and pus ought to be maintained for a healthy body. And so, by draining the patient, it was believed that the patient might be saved. However, such practices only spread contagious fluids and offered no treatment. Before the ready availability of antibiotics, there was an attempt to create elixirs to cure patients, one of which was made from treacle, ale, chives and charred eggshells. And as you can imagine, this offered no reprieve from the disease. It appeared the only solace that could be found was during the winter, as this was when the disease would disappear. 
only to resurface once the weather improved. The death toll would range greatly from city to town to village. Often, it would be around 25 to 30 percent of the population who would succumb to the illness, though it could be much higher. In Cairo, it is believed that 50 percent of the population perished, whilst in Florence, it is believed that 90 percent died of the Black Death. As entire towns were devastated by the disease, those who thought themselves well would flee, leaving ghost towns of the dead and dying. Families would be torn apart as the children would be left by their parents, spouses leaving their affected partner and brother leaving brother. Mass graves were used to accommodate the masses of the dead, with not enough time or available clergy to perform any form of last rite. Those that left would unwittingly carry infected fleas hidden within their clothing and would pose a threat wherever they may have ended up. As there was no viable explanation, many looked to other causes or explanations for their deadly illness. Some looked to the stars, believing there to be some form of astrological cause, whilst others saw the disease as a punishment from God for untold sin. Others pointed the finger at those deemed as other, with instances of Jews being accused of poisoning the wells, often followed by some form of pogrom. Whilst people realised that contact, particularly with the clothes, of the infected could cause infection, it was never understood that it was the fleas and rats that caused the infection. The unsanitary conditions of many towns and villages only assisted in the breeding grounds of rats and their fleas, with the streets often covered in human and other types of waste. By 1351, the Black Death had taken its toll on much of the world's population, though it did leave behind more than corpses as its legacy. As a result of drastic depopulation, survivors found their labour in demand, often receiving greater wages or preferential treatment. As the size of the workforce could not be relied upon for the greater production, improvements in farming were pushed, as too was the focus on animal farming rather than crops. Although, such improvements often came in tandem with some form of resurrectionary laws, preventing social mobility of the peasant classes. For some in Western Europe, it spelled the end of serfdom, whilst for those in the East, serfdom was enforced. Whilst the Black Death laid bare the inadequacies in medicine, it did highlight the importance of surgeons and the role they might play in the field of medicine. But for those who survived, an immense sense of survivor's guilt was commonplace. To witness half of your town or village and your friends and family die in a matter of weeks, only to be left alive without explanation. Groups of flagellants, that is those who inflict pain and punishment upon themselves for atonement, appeared as one way of dealing with their guilt, flogging themselves bloody. Whilst the Black Death of the 14th century was the deadliest, it was not the last the world would see of the bubonic plague. The disease would flare up from time to time, lasting years and taking a heavy toll. It proved an ever-present threat occurring in Europe, the Middle East and Asia. Notable examples include the Great Plague of London in 1665, where around 100,000 people died, which was 25% of the population at the time. It was in the 1850s when the disease struck hard again, starting in China before spreading to much of the continent, to India and to Australia. It is believed that around 15 million people perished, with around 10 million dying in India alone. To this day, the disease still exists, though is largely kept in check by both vaccines and antibiotics. As is the case with bacteria, there is the fear of strains that become resistant to the drugs, as seen in a number of outbreaks in Madagascar in 2014 and 2017. There will be a handful of cases each year in the developed world, with the occasional death. Currently, the three most endemic countries are the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Madagascar and Peru. It is important to note that if the pneumonic plague is left untreated, it is 100% fatal. 
Although it would show up sporadically over the coming centuries, the disease would never again reap such a heavy toll as the Black Death of the 14th century. The Black Death can be seen as an example as just how far we have come in dealing with pandemics. From advancements in medicine to our understanding of transmission, we are truly privileged to live in such times. As our understanding only grows, perhaps one day humanity will be able to look back at the diseases that still affect us today, just as we look back at how far we have come from the events of the Black Death. In the 1980s and the 1990s, a new disease struck the cattle herds of the United Kingdom. Thousands were displaying odd behaviours, followed by death in all cases. This threat to the food chain was made even more catastrophic when it eventually became clear that the disease was transmissible to humans. What would become known as Mad Cow's disease led to the destruction of millions of livestock, widespread panic and the deaths of hundreds from a new lethal disease, a disease with a 100% fatality rate and no known cure. In today's video, we will cover just what mad cow's disease actually is, how it spread to both animals and to humans, and how it was eventually brought under control. Mad cow's disease is more accurately called bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE for short. Spongiform refers to the resulting sponge-like texture of the patient's brain caused by the disease. Encephalopathy refers to a disease that affects the structure of the brain. It is caused by proteins known as prions, a type of protein that can act as a replicating pathogen much like a virus. The prion is malformed, misfolded and capable of warping other proteins and turning them into harmful prions. Such proteins are commonly found in the brain and nervous system, and so when the disease takes hold, the consequences can be devastating, destroying the very structure of the brain. It is a neurodegenerative disease, with symptoms not immediately apparent. It can take years for the disease to present and incubate. The symptoms of BSE include the cow having trouble walking, tremors, and hypersensitivity to certain stimuli. This can include heightened aggression, nervousness, or a general change in the cow's nature. More sporadic signs include weight loss, grinding of teeth, or a reduction in milk production. Ultimately, the cow will enter into a coma before eventually succumbing to the illness and dying. There is currently no treatment for BSE, meaning it is 100% fatal. For some time, cattle farming was the largest part of British agriculture, representing a third of all total output. A particular breed of dairy cow was used that produced a large amount of milk, so long as it was fed a high-protein diet. The source of this protein would be in the form of meat and bone meal, feed that was derived from rendered animals, a cheaper alternative that actually increased the milk yields further. Dairy cows would provide much of the British beef, and the remains and waste products would be rendered down as part of the process. As for how it came to be, the first known case occurred in September of 1985 in the UK. At the time, it wasn't clear what the disease was, but the death of the cow was ultimately attributed to other causes. But by the end of 1986, two more cases had been identified as a new illness. Nevertheless, the state veterinary service's initial response was to impose an embargo on information about the disease being made public. By the end of 1987, BSE was identified as a new disease. One of the initial theories of how the disease came to be is that it was the result of a cross-species transmission. The disease being scrapie. Scrapie is a disease that affects sheep in the same way that BSE affects cows. It was thought that one of the causes could be that the sheep infected with scrapie entered the food supply of the cows through meat and bone meal, or through MBM, a cheaper alternative to feeding cows grain. MBM is the product of the rendering industry, the process of converting waste animal tissues into usable products. Such tissue would include potentially infected nerve tissue from the sheep suffering with scrapie. However, it is more likely that a random mutation in a cow resulted in the harmful prion, which probably occurred in the 1970s. When this patient zero cow was slaughtered, long before any signs of illness presented, 
the remains were rendered into MBM and fed to other cattle. What followed was exponential infection of cows through the feeding of infected MBM, who in turn would provide infected tissues for the cycle to continue. The actions taken to deal with the spread of the disease were set in 1988 and were largely twofold. The use of MBM feed was banned, and it was advised that cattle be destroyed. This vital step of removing one of the key vectors for infection would result in turning an escalating disease into one that would ultimately peak and then decline. But some farmers continued to use their existing supplies of MBM, and some feed distributors continued to sell the product, even well after the five-week grace period given to allow the industry to adapt. It is thought that in 1988, as many as 10,000 cattle were infected each month. The key concern was whether BSE could be passed to humans. As the initial theory was that the cause of BSE was scrapie, and as scrapie could not be passed to humans, it was thought that there was little to no risk of humans being affected, as confirmed in a report advising the government in 1989. Humans had eaten scrapie-infected sheep for hundreds of years with no issue. Nevertheless, as a precautionary measure, the government in 1989 instituted a specified bovine offal ban. This banned bovile brain, spinal cord, tonsils, spleen, and intestines from entering the human food chain. There was then an effort to improve the hygiene standards of the slaughterhouses. It was noted that around this time, over 60% of slaughterhouses did not meet the single European market standards for safe practice. Some slaughterhouses were recorded with blood-encrusted butchering slabs, rampant cross-contamination, and little in the way of staff training. Through the coming years, the rather reassuring theory about scrapie would begin to unravel. In 1990, domestic cats began showing signs akin to that of BSE, or scrapie-like illness. This was attributed to infected tissues being rendered and used by the cat food industry. Soon enough, cases of feline spongiform encephalopathy were found in big cats in zoos. Testing confirmed it was possible for mice to contract BSE, albeit in laboratory conditions. Though it was still thought that humans would need to eat a large amount of infected brain tissue to become infected, but many in the public and media started to panic. If cats could contract BSE by eating infected beef, then why couldn't humans? Some newspapers proclaimed that the disease could be catastrophic to human life, such as The Sun, who published an article claiming that BSE could be as bad as the Black Death. The British government attempted to play down the risk to humans, but evidence was beginning to form that cats could not get scrapie but could get BSE, indicating that it was something very different from the well-understood version that affects sheep. It also perhaps indicated that there was a real risk that the disease could spread to humans. A press release in May of 1990, made by the Minister for Agriculture, John Gummer, stated that it was safe to eat beef. He did qualify this statement, saying that it was safe on the basis that the improvements to how cows were slaughtered, along with the ban on bovine offal, meant there was no risk. In a now much derided public stunt, Gummer and his four-year-old daughter were filmed eating hamburgers to show how safe the meat was. Despite the measures put in place, the infections kept rising in thousands of British herds. Between 1992 and 1993, some 100,000 cases were confirmed, with doubtless many more going undetected. In addition, a complete ban was imposed not only on MBM feed, but also in its use as a fertilizer to avoid any potential cross-contamination. But what had been done was not enough, and had come too late. And in May of 1995, the first victim of a new variant, Crutzfeldt jacob disease, or CJD, was recorded. 19-year-old Stephen Churchill bears the unfortunate moniker of the first person to die from the human version of BSE. He was otherwise a fit and healthy man, looking to join the Royal Air Force. But... He started to appear thin, with changes to his mood, and he started to struggle with his studies and walking. Within the next 10 months, he was experiencing hallucinations, required round-the-clock care, and was unable to communicate, before ultimately succumbing to the disease. Variant CJD affected humans in a similar way to how it affected cows. The first signs will be a strange feeling in the hands, feet, and face, akin to a tingling or burning sensation. 
motor function will decrease, along with a deterioration in a patient's mental faculties. Often the disease will present itself as psychosis or as dementia. Eventually, the patient will fall into a coma before passing. The disease has no known cure and is 100% fatal, leaving loved ones helpless other than to watch a gruelling deterioration. The regular CJD usually affects people over the age of 60. The variant affects people of all ages, including younger people. Whilst it is not 100% clear as to the cause of variant CJD, the first case occurred during the BSE outbreak in the United Kingdom. It was therefore linked to eating beef products, though not through muscle meat such as steak or in milk. It is likely that the infected nervous system tissue was consumed through hamburgers or through other heavily processed foods that included rendered bovine offal. Perhaps the most striking example of a death attributed to variant CJD is that of Peter Hall, who died at the age of 20 in 1996. His death was ruled as a misadventure, with the cause of death being attributed to consuming beef burgers before 1990. Peter had been a vegetarian since 1992, showing just how long the disease took to take hold, being years or even decades. This marked the first time that consuming BSE infected foods was linked to the new disease. This was largely taken as controversial, with many people insisting there was little evidence to draw a link. Nevertheless, the hypothesis stuck. In all, 177 people in the UK contracted the variant CJD all of whom died. It was suspected, though not confirmed, that three of the victims who died were infected through blood transfusions from infected people. As a precaution, blood transfusions from people who had consumed British beef or lived in the country for extended periods of time were barred from donating blood in a number of countries, with potentially infected blood treated as extreme biohazard. Another 50 people around the world contracted the disease, some of whom had lived in the UK, others believed to have eaten exported infected products. None survived the illness. All the while, countless cows were being slaughtered. In order to stop the spread, some 4.4 million cows were destroyed through the entire crisis. But by 1995, cases of BSE were dramatically falling, with that year seeing around 14,000 confirmed cases. By 2000, it was around 1,400 a year, and by 2005, it was down to 225. Many countries, upon seeing the spread of BSE, issued bans on the import of British beef. Some bans lasted years, unwilling to take the chance of exposing their population or livestock to the disease. Today, there are but a handful of cases recorded each year, though with better tracking and awareness of the disease, there is little to no risk from it entering the food chain. The ban on MBM meal for cattle still remains in the United Kingdom. The risk of contracting variant CJD is incredibly low, as it appears to only affect a very small number of people. But, due to the way the prions are not affected by our current medical practices, it remains a terrifying and 100% fatal illness. Combined with the damage that BSE brought upon millions of cows, it is only right that such diseases are treated with caution. A food standards agency was established in the UK to monitor and advise on food safety. Animal byproducts were phased out of products for human consumption, such as medicines. An inquiry into the handling of the situation produced an in-depth analysis, a link to which will be available in the comments. The panic caused by the media and downplaying of the seriousness by the government only led to many people living in fear not knowing whether a burger eaten years ago could lead to an early, traumatic death. Whichever way you look at it, rabies means death. The story of humanity versus various illnesses that plague is one of limitations and successes. No such disease demonstrates this better than rabies, a disease that claims the lives of anywhere between 55,000 and 70,000 people each year. It is an illness that conjures images of aggression, of foaming mouths, and of a fate of certain death. Once the disease reaches the victim's brain, there is little to no hope of survival. In fact, only six people have managed to survive the illness once it reached the stage of infecting the nervous system. 
In today's video, we will cover the facts of the disease and how we have sought to bring it under control, and what more needs to be done to defeat it. Rabies is a virus of the Lyssa virus family, Lyssa meaning rage. It is a neurotopic virus, meaning it has a preference for targeting a victim's nervous system. The rabies virus can present broadly as one of two types, furious rabies and paralytic rabies. Furious rabies is the most common and accounts for around 80% of cases. Furious rabies displays symptoms such as hydrophobia, that is the fear of water, and occasionally aerophobia, which is the fear of fresh air, along with hyperactivity. Once symptoms appear, death usually occurs after a few days due to a heart attack. Paralytic rabies accounts for around 20% of cases and is a longer process than that of the furious form. Muscles slowly become paralyzed, starting at the site of the infection. The victim then falls into a coma until they eventually die from organ failure or cardiovascular collapse. In both cases, death is painful, with the patient experiencing massive damage to their faculties. Rabies is usually transmitted to humans from bites or scratches from infected animals, notably dogs and bats, though it can be spread from other warm-blooded mammals such as skunks and horses. The virus spreads through saliva, which will then enter through the wound. At first, the victim will not display any symptoms, as the rabies virus will be in its incubation period. During this period, it will slowly replicate and spread through the victim's muscular tissues. Due to the low levels of the virus and the location, it is ignored by the host's immune system, which is why it will prove to be fatal. The goal of the rabies virus is to grow and eventually spread to a person's peripheral and central nervous system. During this time, initial symptoms of rabies often include fever with pain and strange tingling feelings around the wound site. Once in the nervous system, it will be able to spread quickly with the goal of reaching the brain. It will then pass through the blood-brain barrier, say from the immune system, which can be difficult to pass through. Even if the T-cells can make it through the brain barrier, the rabies virus is capable of fighting back and killing the defensive cells. Once the brain is infected, the virus will cause encephalitis as the virus affects the pituitary gland, the brainstem, and the hypothalamus, all key areas for regulating a person's behavior. The way the virus affects the victim's brain before death will often result in them exhibiting strange behaviors with the goal of spreading the disease. The victim will produce excess saliva, as this is the vector for the virus to spread. The hydrophobia means the victim will not drink any water, meaning the infected saliva will remain in and around the mouth. Aggressive behavior, especially in animals, will often result in the victim biting or lashing out, infecting others. This whole process can take anywhere from one to three months with the vast majority of this time being the incubation period, though there are reported cases of incubation lasting for up to a year. Humanity has been aware of rabies for at least 4,000 years, with it being understood in Mesopotamia that bites from a rabid dog were to blame. Early treatments for the disease include a poultice made from cloth and hyena skin to a skull of a hanged man. One popular remedy involved cauterizing the wound with a heated St. Hubert's key. St. Hubert was believed to have been able to cure the disease, and so effigies were constructed to ward off the illness with the key heated to cauterize the wound. Others believed the cause were worms that lived in the mouth, and if they were cut out, it would cure the disease. In some parts of India, it is still believed that a person bitten by a dog will be impregnated by a dog, in what is termed puppy pregnancy syndrome. The hydrophobia and other symptoms are incorrectly attributed to the puppies growing inside the abdomen, with treatments focusing on removing these puppies rather than the potential rabies. None of these treatments were effective, and rabies proved fatal in every case. The breakthrough in treating rabies was developed in 1885 by Louis Pasteur and Pierre-Emile Roux in the creation of a vaccine. The vaccine was collected from the spines of infected rabbits. The spinal nerve tissue was dried for a number of days before another rabbit would be inoculated with the weaker strain. The process was repeated until they had access to strains of varying potency. 
This material was then injected into an infected person, with boosters of the more potent strains to follow. Pasteur's method proved to be highly effective, and the practice soon spread far and wide. Since its inception, the rabies vaccine has been developed and refined, though the process remains roughly the same. Once bitten or scratched by a rabid animal, it is vital that medical assistance is sought straight away. The first step is to wash the bite or scratch for at least 15 minutes. Although this will not completely prevent infection, it will reduce the viral load. It is also important to note what species of animal delivered the bite or scratch. And be aware that the closer the bite is to the brain, the less time it will take for the virus to reach it. In the case of bites from bats, due to their small teeth, one may not even be aware that they have been bitten, meaning erring on the side of caution is for the best. During the initial incubation period is when the afflicted will need to receive the course of the vaccine. This will allow the person's immune system to be capable of destroying the virus and avoiding death. The efficacy of the rabies vaccine is near enough 100%. In addition to vaccinating humans, various programs have been carried out to vaccinate wild animals and domesticated dogs. These schemes have been successful in Europe and North America, where cases and death rates are extremely low. If, however, a person is infected and they do not seek treatment, there is an incredibly minute chance of survival. One procedure, dubbed the Milwaukee Protocol, involves a patient who has developed rabies symptoms being induced into a coma. The goal is to reduce brain function as to slow the spread of the disease in hopes of giving the boosted immune system a chance of fighting the virus. Only six people are known to have survived the virus through this method. Though its efficacy is doubted by some who raise concerns whether reliance on the protocol is hampering developments of other treatments. Despite the existence of the vaccines, tens of thousands still die from the virus each year, with around a third of the deaths occurring in India. Most of the deaths in India are children under the age of 15, with bites going unrecognized, unreported and untreated. The prevalence of misinformation around the puppy pregnancy syndrome, combined with a lack of access to the vaccine, are largely responsible for the high death rates from a now preventable illness. Whilst rabies has been rendered treatable, the persistent problems of medical inequality and the lack of education or awareness about the illness allows the virus to claim tens of thousands of lives each year. In today's world, a scratch or bite from a rabid animal is no longer a death sentence, at least in the developed world. For the developing world, there is still work to do. The World Health Organization has goals to rid the world of the infections from dogs by 2030, dogs accounting for 99% of infections. Rabies will nevertheless remain one of the most devastating illnesses in human history, due to its 100% fatality rate before the development of the vaccine treatment. The deaths today should be a reminder of the vital importance of education and access to medicine. Whilst the success reminds us that it's possible to prevent so much unnecessary death and suffering. In 2001, an outbreak of foot and mouth disease devastated the British farming industry. As many as 6 to 8 million animals were culled, and thousands of outbreaks were recorded around the country. Not only was there a massive economic cost, but the outbreak claimed the livelihoods of many a farmer and community. In today's video, we shall cover just what foot and mouth disease is, how it took hold in the United Kingdom, and how the disaster played out. It is perhaps helpful to start with a description of what foot and mouth disease actually is. Foot and mouth disease is separate and different to the human hand, foot and mouth disease. Foot and mouth disease, or FMD for short, is caused by an RNA virus that affects the split-hooved animals. This includes cows, sheep and pigs. An infected animal will present with blisters in the mouth, teats and in between the hooves. These blisters, along with a fever or stringy saliva, are telltale signs of the disease. FMD is incredibly infectious, spread through pus, blood, saliva or stagnant water. It can be carried on a person's clothing, spread by touch, and even by air. The disease can severely weaken the infected and can result in the death of younger animals. 
Animals infected with the disease are not fit for human consumption. It is therefore a disease that those rearing animals for human consumption ought to be vigilant. The first known case for this crisis was in February of 2001, spotted at an abattoir in Essex. A vet by the name of Craig Kirby noticed that some of the pigs for slaughter were displaying clear signs of FMD. These pigs were traced to a finishing farm near Northumberland, owned by a farmer by the name of Bobby Waugh. It didn't take long to inspect Waugh's farm where signs of FMD were evident. The pigs were held in squalid conditions, with majority of the pigs infected at various stages. It was thought that the disease would have been present at Waugh's farm as early as January that year, with him sending his infected pigs to slaughter, risking other animals of being infected. It is believed his pigs were infected by consuming unproperly processed slurry, which contained FMD-infected animal tissues, carrying a relatively new Asian strain of the disease. From both Waugh's farm and the abattoir in Essex, the disease was able to spread to other nearby farms. Through airborne spread and through the sale of infected animals, FMD was able to spread around the country. Exports from the UK were banned by the likes of the European Union, meaning there were more animals for sale domestically. Two livestock markets in the towns of Longtown and Hexham unknowingly sold a handful of infected sheep to farms around England and Wales. From this point, the usual movement of animals with now infected vehicles ensured the disease would continue to spread. For those 25,000 sheep who were sold at the markets on that day along with the infected, they too could have carried FMD to their destinations. Unlike a previous outbreak in 1967, the movement of animals was on a national level. From the sale to the rearing to the slaughter, the animal could be moved multiple times, hundreds of miles at a time. By the start of March 2001, almost 100 separate outbreaks had been recorded around the country. The Ministry for Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, or MAFF, initially believed that the disease could be controlled by slaughtering all animals within three kilometres from a confirmed case. The process would involve the farmer working out the value of his herd before arranging for the slaughterman to arrive at the farm. The slaughterman then prepared the animals into smaller groups. The livestock would then be killed by either a bolt gun or a regular gun, as the former were in short supply. Hundreds of animals a day could be culled on the larger farms, meaning there would be many corpses to be disposed of. Though often, the rotting corpses would have to wait days for disposal. The disposal was often done by mass graves or huge pyres bellowing putrid black smoke. Airfields, commercial dumps and unused grounds were all used to dispose the animals culled during the crisis. By the end of March, this policy saw some 90,000 animals culled, buried and burned. Vast foul-smelling pyres littered the countryside. Yet, despite all the slaughtering, by the end of March, more than 400 outbreaks were recorded. Public access to the countryside was limited as to stop the spread of FMD. Tony Blair, the then Prime Minister, pushed back upcoming local and general elections hoping to bide time and to avoid any potential bad will from handling the crisis poorly. Around this time, another linked outbreak from FMD was recorded in Holland in a number of farms. The Dutch approach at first was the same as the British, to call animals in the immediate vicinity. When this did not provide the desired results, livestock were vaccinated. Over 1,800 farms had their animals vaccinated, which significantly decreased the instances of outbreaks. After two weeks, the vaccinated animals would be culled. By the 22nd of April 2002, FMD in the Netherlands was brought under control at the expense of around a quarter of a million animals slaughtered. By April, the United Kingdom too announced that FMD was under control, but that was far from the truth. At this point, there had been over 1,500 outbreaks of the disease. Focus had shifted from cattle to sheep being the problem. Data from the previous month's outbreaks was scrubbed from the MAFF website, instead only showing the daily figures. The way that slaughters and outbreaks were classified then were altered as to reduce the numbers presented to the public. One example of the consequences of this was that in Cumbria, farmers reported 24 outbreaks of FMD. The MAFF only counted 9 of these. There are plenty of errors that resulted in healthy farms or farms outside of the three kilometers having their livestock culled in error, including an instance of a farm mistaken for one hundreds of miles away. 
Tony Blair's government and the MAFF looked at what measures were taken in the last epidemic in 1967, not amending the protocol to account for 34 years of change. This went as far as reprinting the same no-entry warning signs that had been used during the 1960s. There was little to no new thinking as to how to best deal with the problem. Key lessons such as not moving animals and ensuring the culling and burial of the infected animals were rarely put into practice. There was little thought given to the possibility of a large outbreak of FMD before the cases of 2001. All contingency plans were based on no more than 10 premises affected by FMD at the start of the possible outbreak. It is thought that at the start of the crisis, almost 60 locations were infected. The response was always going to be on the back foot, and without proactive or imaginative thought, the problem would not be easily solved. By May, focus was on the upcoming general election, with little regard given to the some 30,000 animals culled on average every single day. An average of five new outbreaks a day were reported between May and September. The focus on culling infected animals and those within three kilometers remained the only course of action, save for a limited vaccination program in Devon. It would take on average two and a half months to eradicate the disease in a given location, ensuring that it had not returned. By September, the crisis was dealt with, but it would not be until January of 2002 that the last cull took place. The effect on the economy was significant, costing the government £3 billion to deal with the crisis, with a further loss to the economy of £5 billion. It was not only the farmers who lost their entire livelihoods, but many countryside businesses were devastated by the restrictions of movement. Farmers in total received £1.1 billion in compensation for the cattle destroyed. Losses to businesses affected received little to no such compensation. A report into the 2001 outbreak would go on to repeat many of the failures identified by the 1968 report into the previous outbreak. The key failure had in both instances been the delay to respond to the impending epidemic. At the start of the crisis, an animal could only be culled following a positive test for FMD, which delayed matters and risked further spreading of the disease. For those vets, slaughtermen and staff working to control the disease, the toll was great. Many worked 12-hour days, 7 days a week, and suffered greatly in terms of stress and burnout. Out of all of the failures, the role of those slaughtering the animals was the only process held to have been effective, noted for its smoothness and humanity. But there was a massive problem with disposal, with tens of thousands of animal carcasses left to rot in the fields as the scale of the slaughter exceeded capacity. In some instances, the leakage of buried infected animal tissues and blood threatened the groundwater, and thus, a risk of further spread. Delays in bringing the armed forces to assist with the matter only contributed to the poor response. Blair's government failed in a number of ways, but succeeded in complying with the demands of the National Farmers Union. The union was opposed to vaccinating their herds, fearing the economic impact in respect to exporting vaccinated livestock. It was feared that Britain would lose its disease-free status, and its access to export markets worth £570 million a year. The estimated cost of the vaccination program for all of Britain's farms would have been around 200 million, with the possibility of regaining disease-free status a year later. As seen in the example of Holland, vaccination could have played an important role in containing the disease. The MAFF was reorganized and renamed to the Department of Environmental Food and Rural Affairs. Tony Blair succeeded in the general election which was held in June, whilst the disease still ravaged the countryside. One-eighth of the British livestock were culled, whilst official figures sought to downplay the crisis. The foot and mouth disease of 2001 shows the consequences of failing to learn from a previous crisis and the horrific dangers of infectious disease. The subject of today's video is a disease, a disease with a mortality rate as high as 90%. This terrifying illness has no treatment, no vaccine, and no cure, save for helping the patient stabilize and provide them with blood transfusions, 
replacing the severe hemorrhaging caused by the disease. In today's video, we will cover the effects of the Marburg virus, how it is spread, and what can be done to combat this deadly pathogen. The Marburg virus is in the Filoviridae family of viruses, the same family as Ebola. It is an RNA virus that is classified into two variants, Lake Victoria and Raven. However, these two variants present in the same way, and for the purposes of this video, there is no distinction to be made between the two. The disease is spread by infected bodily fluids, such as feces or saliva. It can enter the body through cuts on the skin, or through mucous membranes such as in the eyes or nose. The incubation period can last around one week, during which time the patient is infectious. Symptoms will start fairly benign and common, such as fever, chills and headaches. Vomiting, diarrhea and stomach cramps will soon follow. The truly disturbing symptom, however, is hemorrhaging. As the virus spreads through the body, it triggers the clotting factors in areas where it is not needed. This depletes the body of its ability to create blood clots where needed. It is not at all uncommon to see hemorrhages beneath the skin, or to see blood leak from the eyes, nose or other orifices. The damage inflicted by the virus can lead to the patient falling into comas or experiencing seizures. The liver and the spleen in particular are susceptible to the virus. Usually, death will follow the onset of symptoms after eight or nine days. Those who do survive will likely retain some dormant strain of the virus. This could later reawaken or be spread via sexual intercourse, meaning even after surviving the disease, a patient must be extremely careful. As mentioned previously, there is no treatment for the virus, save for supportive care. A patient will require blood and platelet transfusions. They will also require their blood pressure to be maintained and will need rehydration. As of right now, there is no vaccine for the disease, in large part due to the relatively small number of people infected by the disease to date. Even with its incredibly high mortality rate, investment in a vaccine is seen as not particularly viable or cost-effective. Prevention and stopping the spread of the disease is by far the most effective way of dealing with the virus. Contract tracing, isolating the infected, and providing healthcare workers with proper PPE is vital. So too is having access to adequate and clean medical facilities. Chlorine can kill the virus, meaning that ensuring medical facilities are cleaned can help stop the spread of the disease. And of course, education as to how it is spread is important to avoid transmission. The Marburg virus is found in a common carrier of zootonic diseases, that being bats. The Egyptian fruit bat, found in Uganda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, are known to be reservoirs of the virus. The bats are capable of carrying the virus whilst their own autoimmune response prevents it from infecting themselves. However, their bodily waste and fluids will be infected. There are known examples of tourists visiting bat caves and becoming infected with the virus. However, the first known outbreak of the disease was linked to an entirely different species. The vervet monkey was used in all manner of laboratory experiments, however, some infected with Marburg virus ended up in facilities in Marburg and Frankfurt, Germany. These monkeys were likely infected by exposure to the bats before being captured and shipped off to be test subjects. In 1967, at the Bering Werker and Pau Ehrlich Institute, employees working on vaccines became exposed to the virus. All of the infected employees had worked with and handled blood tissues and organs of vervet monkeys. Some infections amongst the staff came from inadvertent needle pricks and one with an accidental cut to a worker's arm being exposed. One person was infected whilst caring for one of the employees at home. In all, 32 people were infected, with 7 dying. Even at around 25% mortality rate, Marburg virus proved to be a deadly disease. Yet, in more rural countries without adequate sanitation, the disease could claim even more lives. In 1998, a group of gold miners in Durba, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, 
were infected by bats within an abandoned mine. There were 154 cases, with 128 deaths, a morbidity rate of 83%. The disease, however, appeared not to spread very far, limiting infections to a small rural area. Although the largest outbreak to date was in Angola in the year 2004. This outbreak was notable, as it affected larger areas. The origin point of this outbreak was traced to a pediatric ward of a Weech province hospital. A contaminated transfusion machine is understood to have spread the disease, leading to 374 cases. 329 people died, a morbidity rate of 88%. Around 16 of the dead were doctors and nurses, which played a part in reducing faith in the medical system. Some in this outbreak kept their loved ones at home, fearful and not trusting what might happen to them if they were isolated. Home-based treatments using unclean syringes proved to be an important route of transmission for the disease. Thankfully, the disease remained fairly localised and did not spread beyond the Weech region. Since the Angolan outbreak, there have been a few isolated outbreaks in Uganda, Guinea and Ghana. In 2023, two relatively large outbreaks in Guinea and Tanzania saw 33 people infected and 16 killed. Where there is an outbreak, a fast response must be put in place. There is, however, a dark turn to this disease that being its use as a potential biological weapon. According to Ken Alabek, a Soviet biological weapons manager who defected to the US, said that the Soviet Union was working on weaponizing the Marburg virus. According to Alabek, the development reached an advanced stage, though he was not able to confirm whether the weapon was finalized. He has indicated in an interview that it was the Soviet Union's goal to use the virus alongside the likes of smallpox, plague and anthrax as a strategical biological weapon. Alabek also detailed how at least one researcher by the name of Nikolai died following accidental exposure to the virus in laboratory settings. Many other countries list the virus as a controlled or select agent. This means there are limits as to which facilities can have access to the pathogen. This in turn also limits how a potential vaccine might be developed for the virus. The Marburg virus is truly one of the more disturbing diseases, and thankfully is quite rare. The way in which the virus causes severe hemorrhaging, and the fact there is no known cure, will for now keep this disease as one of the more terrifying. Thankfully, exposure requires one to be in close proximity to infected bats, something that most people do not tend to experience. Whilst the risk is low, for many in the world, the infection means almost certain death.